Love that old melody. Uh, never tried to play it before, and of course, I like to follow my face live. I recommend that habit to everyone. Whenever you're going to make a mistake, make a big mistake in front of as many witnesses as possible. Hope everyone's having a good Saturday. This Rev Star is all done. The video on this is going to be coming up soon. I thought I'd give you guys on the chat a sneak peek of the new wiring. And this Victoria is done. And um, that video is 90% edited. It could be up later this afternoon, but it's probably going to be tomorrow morning. Um, so I'm really happy with how both of these things came out, and they work well together. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the previous RevStar video. I already saw it with the, the previous wiring. But now, uh, let's see if I can do it this. Uh, I can't really show it too fully, but neck. <laughs> Nice, snappy, punchy uh, neck. Um, uh, it's a middle position, uh, but with a, a tweak to make it kind of like when you're in the middle position on a, on a Gibson and you adjust the uh, two volume pots differently. So neck. Number two. Just a little softer. Middle. with a little trick to make it sound like the middle position of a Gibson or like Chris Buck's middle position where you have two volume pots in parallel so it, it's not as bright and strident as the stock number three position. And then number four, um, it's bridge with a little bit of the neck blended in and then the whole thing's got a little bit of a cap to roll off some lows. Compared to number two, I mean number three. So not trying to make it sound like a telly or a strat, but just to give some of that uh, kind of strattiness. And then the bridge pick up as I drop my pick. It's worth getting the pick for. Big punchy, big punchy clarity on that. Uh, these are new pickups. These are Kinman's. I'll talk about all that. New pots, new wiring, new knobs. Same guitar. The, the guitar itself, the bones are great. And uh, now all five positions are useful and usable and quite nice. I told him we already got one. It's very nice. All right, uh, let's see, questions. All right, Todd Richmond channeling some old Chicago for us. Good afternoon, Sergio. Hey, Brett, hey, Bertie. Buenas tardes, Emilio. Hey, Ike, I'm glad you made it. Tasty Tone, let's see here. Let's first question of the of the stream. He's restoring a Marshall Bluesbreaker reissue to OG 66 specs. And he likes the videos where I show how the stock one's got the power transformer, or you know, it's output transformer, depending on how you pick to look at it. Polarity reverse, orientation reverse. So there's a big noise field that emanates from the power transformer. And if the output transformer is not uh, uh, at a 90 degree angle to that, uh, so the one wind's going this way, the other wind's going this way, it'll pick up that field even even in standby, but certainly while you're playing it, it just jumps on to, into the entire audio circuit. Um, and so you can, you can flip the position of the output transformer or the uh, power transformer, depending on uh, budget and uh, real estate. He's, but his question is, should a different output transformer be used to better match KT-66s? Um, the one that's in there actually is a pretty good match. The stock one's a pretty good match for KT-66s and a pretty good match for 6L6s. It's not optimal for EL-34s, though all three tube types will work okay. 
uh, I believe that the stock uh, BB reissue, Bluesbreak reissue, um, 1962, uh, output transformer is closer to a KT66 6L6 uh, transformer. Uh, whether different is better is highly subjective. On one of the ones I did, I left the stock one, and I think it had 6L6s or KT66s, I don't recall. The other one, um, due to the owner's preference and uh, prices and availability of tubes, I changed it to a, uh, I think it was a Haber 50-watt Marshall output transformer where the impedance was uh, better suited for 34s. But uh, there's, there's different and there's better, and they're often confused, but sometimes they line up. One bad note is a mistake. Play it again. It was jazz. Yeah, that's that's the, the Miles Davis uh, idea. If you make a mistake, play it again. Make them think you meant it. Yeah, the Yamaha is is pretty, and I think the uh, uh, kind of vertical sunburst, you know, the partial burst, is an unusual thing. It's a, you know, people are gonna love it and hate it. I'm in, I'm in the love it, um, though. I wish that they had a version of this that was just the maple without this because just this maple kind of gives an old 50s Rickenbacker vibe and it, it's you know you can also see more of the grain but this uh, is an unusual take on a burst and I think it's quite lovely the uh, professional made in Japan line has got nicer wood and nicer a slightly nicer burst but the the standard Indonesian still has very nice wood and I think the burst looks great. Some of them go a little too dark. Some of them go a little lighter brown than this. This one's kind of in the middle. Hey, K. Michael P., I don't know nothing about nothing, man. Rax Effects from Switzerland. I don't know whether to greet you in French or German, so I'll just say, hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, Victor is checking in from Hawaii. Aloha, Victor. Yeah, red eye. They're P90s. These are actually the Kinman P90s, uh, which are noiseless and they sound great. And I've played original '50s and '60s P90s, and I've played Lawlers and <coughs> and I've played Duncans, and I've, I've played just about everything out there. And the uh, um, Kinman stuff is great. I use it in my main Strat. They're expensive, but they're great. Um, the neck pickup of the stock Revstar is a really nice sounding P90 if you don't mind the 60 cycle hum. The bridge pickup's not so great and it's not helped out by its placement. It's a little bit farther from the bridge than on a lot of Gibsons that we're used to, you know, a special or a junior. So it gets a little more mid-range emphasis and the pickup, that, the stock pickup doesn't deal with that so well. This Kimman pickup, it's got a little more snap and clarity. You're not gonna get a good idea if, here uh, from off axis, distant mic, on the Victoria, but when you hear it for real, though, uh, you'll hear it. Uh, it's it's very nice, but none of that's necessary to make a, a stock one. You can do the, the the changes I will show in that video for the wiring work just fine on uh, the stock pickups as well as I do on the Kinmans. Everybody checking in, that's cool. Let's see. Hey, Brendan Gauntner. Yeah, well, there are a lot of amps I didn't mention in the amps under five hundred amps under thousand because. There are a lot of amps. Um, there are lots, too many amps. If I was discussing every brand and model out there, I'd still be doing that video today. Uh, the VHTs of today are not the VHTs of 10 years ago when Steve Froyette was running the company. And all the VHTs I've had in uh, that have been made in the last couple of years have been really terrible. Just crap, craptastic. Avoid, avoid, avoid. I don't know whether I've had the Special 6 Ultra I think I had a little 18-watt, 18, 18 and I've seen other techs who have others on the bench. And, uh, I cannot specifically list all the apps that I would uh, avoid uh, in a video. That is one I would avoid. The amps I did point out to avoid in the video were like the Blues Junior and the Hot Rod series because those are so pr prominent. They're everywhere. Everyone is telling you that they're great. There's so many channels telling you they're fantastic. You know, one one very popular guy is saying that a, a Blues Deluxe is an exact sound and exact replacement for a 59 Baseman. It's really not, not at all the same. Don't get one. 
So I, I did specific warnings about some very popular apps, but basically if I'm not recommending it in there or at least discussing it as an option, uh, you know, you f- feel free to ask in comments like this and I'll, I'll weigh in on specific things. It's just hard to address everything in one video because if I make a three hour video and it's encyclopedic and comprehensive, first of all, I can't cover everything in a three hour video. Second of all, most people would watch seven minutes of it. So let's see here. Hello, hello, hello. Um, Sergio, I don't, do I do mail order repairs as in are amps sent to me? Amps are sent to me, but I, I don't know where you live. I only take things from the lower 48 just because the, uh, the cost of shipping, especially across borders, is crazy. Even if the shipping, say, to Canada or Mexico, the shipping itself isn't uh, outrageous. Uh, the customs fees can be crazy. And the customs departments are notorious for saying, hey, this is heavy and it says it's electronic. Let's open it up. I don't know what this is. Is it a bomb? We better take it apart and make sure it's not a bomb. And they don't know how to put it back together. And so you get bent over royally. Uh, but uh, re- reply back. If you're in the lower 48, I'd be glad to help you out. Hey, Ike, I'm glad to help you on that. Thanks, James Maxwell. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Hey, Mr. Spillify. I uh, hope you're having a, have a good rehearsal later. Thanks for joining us now. He's, uh, He's debating between scaring everyone with a Friedman BE100 Deluxe or a Diesel Paul, leaning diesel for something different. Thoughts? I have not tried that model of diesel. I have played and uh, worked on a a few diesels. Um, It's nice that you have such a terrible choice and you can make that choice. You could show up today with the diesel next time with the Friedman. I will say that the Friedman and the diesel are very different sounding apps. They're very, very very different sounding takes on high gain and what the role of the, of the guitar should be in the band and the mix. Um, I would in general be surprised if the band where the diesel shines is the same band context where the Friedman shines and vice versa. Friedman's all about mids, punchy mids and the, the free, uh, the diesel stuff I mean, it has mids, but it, it's a little more towards the, uh, uh, let's say evolving out of the scoop, but, but with an upper mid range emphasis. So they, they slot into music very differently. Yeah, well, Kimball, the Rev Star is a good guitar. And, but the thing is, uh, Chris Buck sounds phenomenal playing through any good guitar. And he's done things with a little little Fender short scales and he's done hollow bodies and he's done rev stars and strats and all these things. He all sounds, he always sounds like himself. You know, you can hear the difference in pickups and stuff, but, um, he's such a good player that it's hard to learn all that much about a particular guitar from him because he's going to sound pretty much as good on his $2,000 rev star as he does on, uh, a 58 Les Paul that one of the shops in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, sorry, I'm drawing a stupid blank today. Um, uh, Wales lends him, I, to get to Wales. I had to go to Dylan Thomas in my head. So hence the, the little mental silent hopscotching. I know Wales is normally at, you know, right there, but it was gone. I was whaleless. So Chris, Chris is hard hard uh, to judge the guitar by because he's also good enough that he can identify when a guitar's got issues and uh, and work around them. And that's that's a, an incredible skill, but it can be just like, hey, yeah, this G's always going to be going sharp, so I'll, I'll tune it flat. I won't play the open G, and I'll kind of nudge each note to, to being in tune, not to go too far down there but yeah when a guitar is really good and the guitarist is really good then the guitarist can not can stop fighting and making it work and can express themselves more fully 
Uh, not that I'm a particular example of anything. I, I, uh, uh, what was the thing in um, uh, the, uh, Child's Life magazine? Uh, Goofus and Gallant? He, he's Gallant. I'm Goofus. Uh, let's see here. Hey, Glenn Brown. Good morning to you too, sir. When replacing speakers in a 100-watt amp, Beyond selecting the correct impedance, what specs should I look for to get an idea of how speakers will sound? Well, you need to make sure um, that the speaker wattage is up to task. And um, some 100-watt amps are going to be really hard on some 25-watt speakers. If Even if you have four, which technically gives you 100 watts, in general, you want to have uh, speakers rated for twice the power that's expected to go through them. So unless you are chasing a specific tone and you know that the Celestian Greenback, for instance, from a certain year, pre-Rolo, whatever game you want to play, or Scumbacks, can really handle it, you might want to say, I'm going to use 50-watt or higher speakers, even if I have four of them with my 100-watt amp. As far as specs to, to know how speakers will sound, they're kind of meaningless. If you look at all the diagrams and, and graphs out there, um, they, they're kind of good at comparing one speaker to another within the same manufacturer's lineup. They're not great for comparing, in general, say a Jensen to an Eminence to a Celestian. Uh, the number, which is, which is pretty valid because that, that's a, usually an, a dBA-weighted value, is the efficiency. So you can say, oh, this one's, a fi- this one's 99 dBA, this one's 94 dBA, this one's 87. Uh, you know, that 99 to 93 uh, dBA is 6 dB. That's almost twice as loud. Um, is more complicated than that, but you can have the same wattage out of the speak out of, out of the amp, but the more efficient speaker, it's going to be can be very noticeably louder. Uh, the best bet is to um, listen to as many videos as you can, go and play as many different speakers as you can, and form your own opinion before taking the plunge. Um, or you can ask people who do what I do what their opinions are. And my opinions on speakers are formed after playing and hearing an awful lot of them. But it's never, hey, this is what I love. This I listen to what the player is looking for. And I go through my mental database and I'm thinking, okay, that guy's going to love uh, uh, an imminent swamp thing, even if I don't, or a Texas heat, you know, um, or that guy needs to have some old Alnico thing that's almost under underpowered for the certain sound he's getting. Um, you know, so. But the only way you can know is to play through speakers yourself. And if you've got buddies who have cabs with different speakers, see if you can bring your amp to their house and plug into it or if you can borrow anything before we make a big, you know, because say $70 per speaker, that's not the cheap end of the scale these days, times four, uh, you know, that's a big investment to make blind. Hey, Brett, good to see you. Uh, yeah, those those uh, Route 66s came out great. Yeah, the Parsonic can be made into a very good amp. It, it's almost there. Um, you know, it's 35, 40 years old now, so most of the electrolytic caps are probably due for replacement. The main issue with the Parsonic, and you can find this on all the forums, is that they really did a stupid thing with the uh, reverb recovery stage, reverb uh, mixer stage, where it just has uh, way too much gain and it's hissy at all times. And Fender published in the in the late 90s a uh, factory fix for that. It's like four resistors and two caps. It's a fairly easy thing to change out. It, it is, uh, I think the ProSonic is, if you're not looking for the traditional Fender sounds, so it it comes close to some of those. If you're looking for the closest thing Fender ever made to a, a, a boogie, um, I think that's the amp. And I think it is better built than the other amps from that era of Fender. And I think it is better built than any boogie. Um, and, you know, it is a fairly simple uh, but well-executed circuit. And if you want it to have more X, less Y, we could tweak from there. But the main issue with an old ProSonic is just cleaning the jacks, uh, uh, cleaning the switches and the pots, resoldering all the uh, solder joints on the board, checking for any other cracked, le- cracked solder joints, replacing electrolytics as needed, which 
typically will be at this point. That's a generational service. Every 20 years it should be. And then fixing that stupid reverb noise issue. Let's see. Thank you for the super chat there, Juice Box. I'll get to you shortly. Thank you, Ryan. Hey, Sergeant Grinch. Uh, Sergio, I don't have any opinion of black heart amps because I've not had one in or seen one. Hey, Travis, yeah, you're very welcome. You know, I see so many forum posts about various things, Alarmar versus Type 3 versus this. And forum posts are a mixture of really good information and really bad information. And unless you already have all the answers, it's hard for the average guitarist to sort them out because people never say, well, this has some strengths and some weaknesses. It's always, this sucks, or this rules. And anyone who says, but what about this? You're an idiot. You know, it's just, it's, it's so exhausting. And nothing is ever good. It's exemplary. Nothing's ever, oh, it's okay. It, you know, it sucks. Or what's worse is when something's not great, but it's the first example of something that someone has ever tried, and therefore they love it, and they think it's the best. It's like if, if, if you've never had ice cream in, in your life, and someone gives you Baskin Robbins rum raisin, you may think, wow, this is the best ice cream in the world. And if someone says, but have you tried pistachio gelato? They're going to say, no, man, I already found it. I already got the best thing in the world. You know, so sample size, uh, range of experience, these matter. And a lot of the forums, you lose that. Or the guys who do know what they're talking about get shouted down by the, by the Baskin Robbins rum raisin guys. Um, so whenever I can, I try to put stuff out there, uh, just very fact, matter of factual. It's not a matter of, this is the best master volume. This is all you'll ever need. It's like, Hey, this has a low parts count. There's no heat issues. It usually works great. Most people love it. Here's how it works. Here's how you install it. If you want to, and if you want something else, do something else. It's much easier. And if you just take ego and, and, uh, and, uh, the need to be right out of the equation. Juicebox Desmond, thank you very much, sir. He recently acquired a Marshall DSL 40C. Something in it is rattling at mid to high volumes. What are some likely culprits? Well, um, number one issue with all tube amps is always going to be tubes. Uh, so you could have a microphonic preamp tube very easily. It could be a power tube. Preamp tubes are usually are more likely the suspect, but it can be power tubes. It could be that someone serviced that amp in the past and one of the screws inside was not tightened all the way down and has vibrated loose. It's fairly easy to pull the chassis on that and just, you know, with the amp powered off, identify all the Phillips screws. I believe they're all number twos. There might be some number ones. I think they're all number two Phillips screws that hold the board to the chassis. Just make sure they're all tight. Um, I don't recall whether the DSL 40C uses what's uh, called a, uh, a um, cage nut, whether it uses cage nuts or whether it uses metal inserts for the screws. Um, uh, sometimes an amp will have a cage nut, which is popped loose and it'll be rattling around inside the chassis. Sometimes the little uh, metal uh, roundels, which are supposed to be uh, welded to the chassis or embedded in the chassis that, that, that the screws that hold the chassis to the cab go into, sometimes those will come off and be lo rolling around inside the amp, in which case you can usually epoxy them back if you're very careful. Um, but if you have anything rattling inside the amp and, it, and you know, like pick up the amp and gently shake it and you hear it, that's not a tube and that's something you need to investigate because it's very likely there's some bit of metal rolling around inside the chassis and if that contacts a wire or a connection somewhere you can have a bad short you can have big issues uh, it's also possible there's just some little nut that held something in place that's come loose a, tra a transformer whatever investigate uh, take that seriously but don't panic it's probably something minor uh, it could also just be some a bundle of wires that are vibrating you know against the uh uh, the uh, top of the cab or something, you know, it depends on if it's, if it's, uh, rattling in the rattling song is coming through the speaker. Or you're just hearing it in the room. Hey, Rod McLeod, I've done, um, something on the Fender Vibro King and the, uh, it's on the Facebook Sonic audio page. 
because uh, I've not had another one come in and I will not take another one. And because they are steaming hunks of overpriced garbage, terrible, terrible, uh, unnecessarily complicated ground schemes um, with the world's worst attempt at a star grounding system. Uh, massive, massive wires used for that, which serve no role. Um, a really poor quality PCB disguising itself as an eyelet board. Uh, these stupid, cheap, cheap, the cheapest of the cheap alpha dual gang, I think they're all 500K linear pots that they uh, wire in series in parallel or by themselves to get all the, all the various values that they need for that amp. It's just bizarre. It's bizarre how shoddy they are and how noisy they are. And uh, it's just this, the Fender 6, 6G whatever uh, reverb tank circuit grafted onto the input of one channel of a super reverb, but they got the input impedance wrong of the super reverb input, and, and they've got a ground loop built into the, the insert point between the reverb circuit and the um, uh, super reverb circuit, and the, uh, the driver tube for the reverb uh, likes to self-immolate because they're asking way, way too much of it as far as heat and current. But it looks really pretty on the outside. Before uh, it starts to have catastrophic failures and bad hum, it can sound okay. But when pe something looks pretty and it sounds okay, a lot of people think it sounds great. And someone, a guitar player back in the day, needed to get Fender to do another six-month uh, big co full-color layout uh, commitment. So they gave it a, a editor's pick, and that we're all been we've all grown up being told that it's a good thing, and it's not. You know, and that's that's just how the world works, and it it sucks. You know, much like the Vibro King. My thoughts on two rock and amplified nation amps. Ryan wants to know. Um, I have no experience or knowledge of amplified nation. I did see. Uh, the last 15 minutes of Keith Williams at Five Watt World's interview with the, the guy from from uh, uh, Amplified Nation yesterday, and I'm going the day before yesterday, and I'm going to go back and watch that. I actually had a call from Keith yesterday. It was nice. We had about a, a little over two hour uh, talk over coffee. He's he's just as genuine and interesting and and nice as he comes across. Um, very nice guy. Very glad to make his acquaintance finally. Uh, as far as two rock, I think they're really good quality. Um, I would never pay that because I don't want a Dumble. I mean, granted, if I wanted one, I'd just build one. I'm I'm in a unique position in, in the world. If I wanted something to exist, I'd make it exist. <clears throat> but for those that do want various Dumbles, I think Two Rock is a great option. I'm sure Amplified Nation probably is too. I, I don't want to say anything disparaging about them without any reason to. Uh, everyone seems to like them. They're really pretty. Um, when you get to Two Rock and Amplified Nation prices, people don't understand. Oh my God, that's $4,000. That's $5,000. Well, yeah, the supply and demand to build an app that does all those things and to build it at a certain quality level with hand wiring this, hand wiring that and really good components, um, you've got to have, you're going to have expenses, you know, and you're going to have to have very well-trained workers doing it, and, and they're all going to need to be inspected. And, um, you know, how many employees does it take to make enough to supply demand? Well, all those employees need, all those employees need to have, you know, regular salaries, and they need to have uh, health care, and benefits and uh, the lights in the building cost X, Y, and Z and the, and the plumbing costs X, Y, and Z. And they've got to buy however many thousand cardboard boxes a year and have all the literature printed up and all this stuff printed on the boxes. And they've got to ship to the dealers and the dealers need to have uh, some um, ability to make a profit on it. So there's got to be a typically a, at least a 30% uh, margin built in for dealers to make some money on this kind of stuff. So yeah, you end up with a, an expensive app, and you're everyone's used to paying for mass production stuff from Fender, Marshall, and the usual suspects. To do it on a much smaller scale and to do it at a much higher quality level costs a lot. So you get what you pay for, and I'm confident that if you like the sounds that Two Rocks make, you are getting what you pay for. Um, 
I think that if the guy from Two Rock, I don't know the, the owner or, or designer's name, I think if you're here on the stream with me, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope that you will do, and he would say that I hope you you love the sound of the amps we make, but you know, that's all subjective. For you know, I've had I might have him on the channel at some point. Um, I'll be getting in touch with Doctor Z at some point. I've had Friedman on. I'm gonna have John Sir on, but just like earlier, you know, should I take the Friedman or the Diesel? They're both really, really good. Um, neither is better. They're just different. Um, so I, I'm sure if I had a two rock here, uh, people would think it sounds fantastic, and I can see the appeal of it. It's just the Dumble thing. I like the cleans, but the cleans in a Dumble aren't that different from a Fender. Uh, sorry, they're just not because it comes from a Fender. I like I like I like Dumble's mids approach. Uh, not crazy about the jazz setting and all that. Uh, the overdrive, it's good. I think it's overblown. I think it's way overstated. But uh, uh, I don't personally go for a real creamy overdrive. I'm I'm coming more from a, a Zeppelin Rush place. I like I like Marshalls for overdrive, and I like big clean apps for big clean apps, and and I like grunty in between things like this and or, or a vox too but you know the 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 i i've i've if i listen to a robin ford record i never think i want to sound like that and that's not because i don't like robin ford or, or i disrespect him or think anything bad it's just not my cup of tea and it's obviously his and that's what makes the world great sorry i ramble Hey, Mickey Park, Parker. Yeah, in the uh, on the Rev Star with the P nineties, the middle position, number three in the stock amp. Uh, sorry, sorry, the stock guitar. I'm so used to talking about amps. It is uh, noise canceling. The uh, one of the pickups is reverse wound compared to the other. The other four positions on the stock amp, uh, stock guitar duh, are not noise canceling. On this one, where we put in the Kinmans, all five positions are, are are quiet. No no sixty cycle hum. But yeah, if you're gigging a stock P90 equipped Revstar, position three uh, is noise canceling. No, 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 Mario V. Weird question, but can you plug in a set of headphones into a speaker output in either a tube or solid state amp? In a tube amp, you'll if you do that, you'll blow your output transformer shortly after you smoke your headphones. Solid state amp, uh, you'll just smoke the headphones um uh no that's a much different level um uh, it might be fun to do with a solid state amp sometime just to watch the little earbuds go, literally go up in smoke do not do that many many solid state amps these days do have headphone outs and that's uh at its at its most basic level that is a speaker level output that has been greatly reduced in volume um, uh, and level so that headphones won't smoke. I think the Marshall Class 5 had that. Many other amps do it out of the preamp. Um, please, please do not plug your headphones into the speaker out of uh, any tube or solid state amplifier, uh, especially a tube, because it will kill something in, or potentially kill something in the tube amp. Hey, Gooden. Hey, Magisterium Guitars. Hey, I... I you don't have to answer this if, if you like to have a veil of secrecy. But you know, I was in Brad's chat talking to you the other day, and Magisterium Guitars is just way too much to say or type, and so is Magisterium. So what's your name, man? I'd, I'd rather say hello to you by name. Um, I try to remember everyone's name as much as possible. Sergio Mendoza asked, Two Notes Capture X safe to use as a load box? I don't know. I would assume so, or I would be inclined to think so, but I don't know that for a fact. That's the kind of thing I would, I would uh, phone a friend and call John or, or or Dave or someone more in the LA world. Just, I just don't get a lot of clients here who need load boxes, and so I, uh, my knowledge of them is theoretical. I could draw up a circuit for one that would be safe. But for me to build that would be much more expensive than just to go buy the one that John or, or Dave already has because mine would be a one-off and theirs is most of the overheads already been paid for to design what they have. Let's see. 
Hey, Lauren Billington. He says, do you have any opinion on whether it's typically better for the life and longevity of the amp to run a solid state or a tube rectifier in amps with switchable rectification? Uh, as far as the life and longevity of the amp, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, if you run, if you have it a switchable option and you run it um, um, in diode mode, then your, your rectifier tube will last a lot longer. Um, it's just uh, the only reason to, that besides sonic preference that solid state rectification is better by any degree than tube rectification is that a couple of diodes cost less than a dollar total versus $30 and up for a rectifier tube. And rectifier tubes are the uh, tube which fails more than any other tube in a tube amp generally. And they generate a lot of heat. If you have an amp that's affected by the heat of its rectifier tube, someone did not, did not design the amp well, and it can just be as simple as, hey, that, that transformer is just an inch too close. But in general, amps can handle the heat generated from a rectifier tube, and the, output, sorry, the power transformer uh, can provide the current if it's a proper, properly ch chosen and, and indicated by the manufacturer of a rectifier tube. Um, but... Uh, other than that, some guys hear a difference, some guys don't. Many people think that they do. Hey, Bruno Suchek. Um, hey, he, he's once, he did his my mods to a AC30 Custom Classic. Wow, what a difference. Sounds killer now. Glad to be of service, sir. Um, yeah, I mean, the CC, when it came out, and the, no disrespect to Steve Gringrod, who did it, because he did a lot of really great amps, too. But there were some choices he made that I've never been sure were his choices versus what some marketing department asked him for. Because the CC, as it was designed, um, had much less gain than a real one, much less compression than a real AC30, and it was really bright. It's, I've explained it to people usually that if you thought Roger McGuinn from The Birds was playing... Uh, his Rick, Rick 12 string into a, a Vox. He wasn't. It was a DI box on all the records or a twin live. But people think that that's a, a, a Voxy sound. And so it's kind of like they made the custom classic to get the sound people thought McGuinn was getting. And it, 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 it's a good sounding amp in stock form, but it doesn't sound very Voxy and it's very bright. And there's an effects loop. Uh, mis factory mistake. I published the fix for that. Yeah, but you know the bones of it are good. I think the the custom series is, is a better buy these days. But when the custom classic was um, the uh, the entry point for Vox, you know fifty dollars worth of parts and three hours of careful work later, you've got a much better sounding app. So I'm glad to have been able to put that out into the world, and that Mr. Bruno here liked it. Travis McCartney. All right, here's the trouble. What are the best brand of 250K pots for a Strat wiring? I bought CTS 250K audio taper, but the volume pot, pot only seems to work from 6 to 10 and not much sweep under 6. There are two issues, first of all. A lot of the CTS audio pots, they use the same wiper, the same track, rather, the same track for the non-switched pots and the switch pots. And so from about, if you're looking at it on a clock face, from about nine o'clock down to seven o'clock, there's no change because they use that same track in the switch pots where they don't want to have anything there. And so that part of a lot of CTS audio taper pots is kind of useless from nine o'clock down. Second of all, and I'm, I'm going to be showing this in the RevStar video because people have asked questions about this, linear versus audio taper uh, guitar volume pots. Maybe I'll show a little bit right now. So these are 500K audio taper pots. And through this relatively clean app, it's going to seem like I turn down just a little bit and the volume goes way down. So that's like a quarter turn of the pot. Go down halfway down. Almost gone. 25% uh, down, 25% uh, up. You're not hearing anything right now. But that's through a low volume cleanup. If this were a 100 watt Marshall or that basement over there, which I can't do on here because it would clip the mic, 
instead of going from this to this, it would go from a big, loud, overdriven sound, and then you back it off, like almost off, and you get a really nice, clean sound out of the same amp. That's the Eddie Van Halen trick that Jimmy Page did. Uh, uh, Hubert Sumlin did it. I mean, it is an old trick. Just have your amp breaking up when the volume's all the way up. But that's the issue. Is if you're playing into a clean amp, then all the usable range is in, is in a narrow part of the pot travel uh, with a on your uh, with an audio taper pot. If you're playing into an overdriven distorted amp, then the dirt to clean is in a much wider range of the pot. You'll still be hearing the stuff through the amp that's he barely on here. You'll, you'll hear that through the big overdriven amp. But if you are a jazz guy who never want, is going to have any amp distortion whatsoever, or you're playing any style where you just, you're gonna have the sound always very clean and you just wanna have fine control over the subtleties, that's when a linear taper volume pot can be better because then you have a wider range of subtle controls. It depends on the genres you're playing and how you approach the guitar. Um, if you're doing volume swells, typically an audio taper is better as well because you, you have better control with your pinky. Um, so that's audio versus linear, and that's part of the issue. That's the other part of the issue that you're having with the CTS. Besides the fact that the track uh, uh, is, is not as good on the CTS standard audio taper pots, it's also the fact that if you're playing into a clean app to test it, you're, you're not hearing everything the guitar is putting out because of the, the context I just mentioned. All that said, <clears throat> there aren't a lot of great ones on the market right now because a lot of um, the people who've been offering them were the, the supply has been devastated by COVID and everything. Uh, like Emerson is now, sell, now selling CTS pots. They used to have the Emerson, Emerson branded pots that were made for them by CTS, but they said Emerson. Those were great. Uh, Mojotone vintage tapers are great. Uh, they've got a few values in stock. Most of them are still out of stock. Um, the um, uh, RS Guitar Works used to have super pots. They, they brought, ran them as super pots. Uh, if they have them now, they only sell them in kits. You can't buy them individually anymore, which is frustrating. Um, I don't have one to show you, do I? I might have one to show you, just one second. Uh, I think I tossed it. Had, had, had one dud, that's the other fun thing, is sometimes you still get duds. But for those pots in there, and for some new pots in my telly, which is being rebuilt back there, you'll see that in the coming weeks. Um, there is a version of CTS pots, and I got it, I think Tone Shapers on Reverb. It was the best price and availability. Um, it is a CTS low torque pot, and the taper in the low torque CTS is not the same taper as in the standard CTS. Um, so it depends on how much torque you want. Um, those are really good, the low torque CTS. Um, you can also go to burns. You can do either the burns that look like a CTS, or you can do the burns that have the bl little blue box that they're trickier to wire, and they don't offer as much shielding. Um, I don't. I like alpha pots for uh, amps. I don't like them for guitar um, because you can't really solder to the case very well or very easily. There are workarounds around that, but. Um, there just aren't as many pots on the market these days. I'm hoping that they'll come back. But for a Strat, since it's a, a knurled shaft, I think you can just go to Mojo Tone and get the 250K vintage taper. Now they have they have two. They have the standard CTS that says Mojo Tone, and then they have the Mojo Tone vintage taper. The vintage taper is the one you want. Much different taper, much different response. But Going back to what I just said, if you're always playing clean, you might prefer linear. And it's an easy thing to find out because you can just get two alpha dollar fifty pots just as a test. Hey, Matthew McGraw, looking for text in the central Ohio area. I know uh, Rick... 
Someone keeps asking me about this. He's in Columbus, Ohio, which is not central, but, you know. Um, Rick, I can't remember his last name right now. I'm so sorry. Um, I don't know Corey. I don't know Abel Audio or Randy Atkins. Sorry. Uh, well, sorry to hear about Randy passing. Um, is it Rick Steff? No, that's a keyboard player here in town. I will find that information and put it in the comments. I meant to do that for another guy asking about Tex in Ohio. I'm not saying he's the only good guy in Ohio, but I know that he's good and he's in Columbus. So I'll, I'll, tr- I'll remember to put that in the comments after the after the broadcast. Sorry not to be uh, better. You know, it's, it's odd. Someone emailed me asking about, if do you know any good Tex in Denmark? I'm like, yes, I know a great Tex in Denmark. He's in Odense. But Ohio, I'm almost stumped. Um, it's funny how that works. Um, wait, wait, it's not Rick. It's, um, drawing a blank. I know two really good texts, one in Ohio, one in, uh, Pennsylvania. I mean, I know lots of good texts, but two, they have the same first name and I can't remember the various last names. And now, now I can't even remember the first name. So I need more coffee. Hey, Todd, Jenny. Hey, Tanner McGage, this is the Sony ZV-E10 uh, that I use for all the videos for the pa- since the past year or so, uh, though I'm getting better with it. But I also set it up here for the live streams. Hey, McFats, I'm glad, glad you could join us. Reverend says they modeled their RevStar after the Sensei. I think you're I mean Reverend says Yamaha modeled the Rev Star after the Sensei. I'm I'm familiar with the Reverend Sensei, but I'll check it out sometime. Thank you for joining us. Hey Rocker five three four, he came across a Marshall Class five with my Plexi mods. Considering it, your thoughts? Um, I don't know whether it's one that I did or whether it's one that someone did my mods to. Either way, honestly, I stopped doing them because even after I modded them and did all this work on a relatively cheap amp, including rotating the output transformer because they, they hummed in the first two versions of it, they would have other failures because the things were just made so fragilely. And I eventually told people, I'm not going to work on your amp um, because you're going to pay me $200 to make this sound good and then something else is going to fail because they just cheaped out too much and I, I i felt bad i felt like i was taking advantage of people so if you if you if you're in a position to play it and you like the way it sounds and you're okay with the fact that hey something may burn in the next five years go for it that's one of the amps i wish i'd never worked on because it almost gave a seal of, uh sense that i gave it a seal of approval and uh, at best i gave it a seal of it sounds better now. I hope it lasts. And they, they tended to have other issues. So, Hey, on the rocks. Yeah, standby switches are hard on the apps if they're done poorly. I've, I've talked about this a lot in the AC30 uh, Custom Classic videos. I talked about this in the Route 66 videos. And I talked about it in the video I did the other day on the Victoria, though I just kind of referenced what I said in the Route 66. Looking back at the uh, first Route 66 video I did two, three weeks ago, where I show the problem and why the problem's there. Um, and there are, there's another video I have on my channel, Does This Amp Need Standby? Uh, if you have a solid state rectifier, you probably do need to use standby. If you have a cath- an amp which has a cathode follower, it can be beneficial to use standby. If you have an app that does not have a cathode follower, that has a tube rectifier, you will rarely need to use standby unless some numbskull accountant put in 350 volt caps and when the, the, uh, the, the, tubes, the B plus isn't loaded by the output tubes working, the, the, the voltage exceeds that capacitor rating. The, basically, there are two conditions that standby fixes. If the filter capacitors are not rated for the full unloaded voltage, which and if you're not familiar with that, say that your amp is have has a B plus of 450 volts when the tubes are work, warmed up and working, but before those tubes warm up, your B plus is closer to 500 volts. Well, if you have 450 volt filter caps, every time you power the amp on, if you don't use standby, that voltage will exceed that. 
uh, 450 volts. And it's going to be right at the limit even when the tubes do warm up. But if you have uh, caps rated for higher than that, like in a Marshall, you have series capacitors. So you have a um, 1,000 volts capability in the first two stages of most 150-watt Marshalls. In that case, um, the only reason to use standby uh, would be because it has a cathode follower. And without standby in a stock ca cathode follower circuit, you can have an issue with the cathode voltage versus the heater voltage. It gets complicated. And you can also have way too much DC present on the grid until the tubes begin to warm up, which affects the cathode stuff. I don't want to go too much in the weeds on this. Um, so in a well-designed app, all the filter caps, their voltage rating exceeds the maximum potential voltage that will be present when the amp is powered on, regardless of whether the tubes are drawing that power down. And um, standby at that point is really only necessary if you have a cathode follower. There's some tricks you can do, with, or a tech can do with resistors and diodes to make a cathode follower stage immune to those problems. And Merlin Blinko's site, valvewizard.co.uk, shows that. But um, there are an awful lot of amps which have a standby for a marketing reason because they, people think a quality amp has a standby and it's often done poorly. So see that uh, Dr. Z Route 66 video I did a couple weeks back where I, I show you what the problem is and why it's not a problem in, say, a super reverb. Uh, if you're using a trimmer verb, spongy blues channel tube racks, um, uh, if you're using a trimmer verb, uh, you, I believe it has a, yeah, it has a cathode follower stage. So use the standby, but the trimmer verb standby wiring will not hurt the rectifier tube the way some rectifier circuits work. So it's fine using a trimmer verb. And you, uh, if you do the spongy, uh, diode solids, you know, diode tubes selection or the spongy bolts selection. Do it with amp and standby. It just makes things easier on the amp. Um, best, you're asking for tube recommendations uh, for a trim of verb that should be a 5U4. Uh, get get the short bottle 5U4 GBs. There are 5U4s that are, look like giant light bulbs. They're really tall. You don't want those. You want the ones about the same size as a GZ34. So if tech, uh, 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 TAD and JJ all make pretty good versions of them. Hey, uh, I, I missed you, Fur Dog, and on the rock, I missed you, Fur Dog. I'll get back to you. Jimmy Max says they have a video of the JMP mod I discussed on the Heads First live stream. Um, yeah, look on my channel for twenty two oh three and two twenty two oh fours. I know I've got one of them that shows that. I don't know if I went into detail in that, but. Um, um, Pretty sure one of those does that. It might not have been one of the 22 or 2204s. It might have been an amp that I modded. It might be in the Marshall playlist. I don't recall right now. It's there. Um, it's it would be that one was at the very early days. I'm not even sure if it's if it's not on YouTube. It might be on Facebook. Um, but look through my 2203, 2204s, and seriotones, and anything Marshall related. And I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. I mean, um, I've got like over 900 videos. I don't remember everything that I've done. I mean, I, I know what I know, which will let me do them, but I don't, I don't recall what's in a video from three years ago. And I'm sorry. Um, but I will probably be showing that again in the future. And I, I, I bet Jason will be showing that soon because I, I think I saw a light bulb go off over the boy's head. I call him the boy. He's, he's my age. He just looks younger. Bastard. Uh, let's see. Fur Dog, any thoughts on East Amps? I have no thoughts on East Amps. I'm, I don't. This is the first I've heard of them. Sorry, Fur Dog. But I did, I did want to acknowledge your question. Hey, McFats, appreciate that. He took a 66 Vibrolux Reaver in for new caps in the doghouse. Dex says I shouldn't change him, but I had him do it. Got grounded plug, no death cap, but the ground switch still works. Is this okay? Um, if you have a grounded power cable without a death cap, 
then what is the ground switch doing? Um, and the ground switch may be physically in the app and not do anything, but are you, did he wire it so it disconnects the ground? Um, I don't want to badmouth your tech because I have very incomplete information for that, but that, that does not make sense. You either have, uh, if you have a, a, a ground switch in, the, in an app, it has to have the death cap for it to function. You can see it done in, in, in PV 5150s. It's not usually necessary, but it can be done. And there are better caps to use. Uh, if you must do it, you, you certainly need to replace that 55-year-old uh, uh, original death cap. Um, it was never rated for AC anyway. Um, I'm not arguing with your tech, but if the tech says you shouldn't change your filter caps, if they were original, you might be, want to be changing techs. Hey, Clyde. If He, he asks if you were splitting a fractal to stereo. The fractal uh, stuff is cool. What two amps would you use? Two similar, two different, looking for versatile, under 20 watts each. Thanks. Back to work for me. Um... Okay, so you're talk. I, I don't know which fractal you're talking about. Whether it's one of the full modelers, which has all the amps and stuff, or like the FM9 or whatever FM6, which is focused more on effects. Um, if you, I, I, I'm not a big fan of stereo effects anyway, so I'm not sure that I would do that. Um, Trying to think of a way to say this. I, I like a... I don't trust stereo rigs most of the time. I think um, it gives you op option paralysis and it rarely sounds good live and it makes it harder to fit in the role of the band. Um, if you're Steve Vai, it's fine. Go for it. But most people aren't playing guitar publicly in the context that Steve Vai does it. They're in a band. And they are uh, an equal member, and the guitar doesn't get to have the entire stage, so to speak. I would, f but if you must have a stereo rig, it depends on whether you want the only stereo information to be in the effects, or if you want to have uh, different sounds left to right. And only you can choose what that's going to be. Um, and you can just. If you have two amps right now, you can set them differently. But I'll, 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 let's, let's say if I did want to have two different amps left and right, under 20 watts each, looking for versatile, get an AC-15 and get a Princeton. Because even if you... Because then you could use it for the stereo thing. You get similar but not, not the same sounds. They complement each other very well. One will have more mids. One will have more lows. Um, you know... And then if you don't want to use the full rig, you go, hey, I'll be right over. I'm going to grab the Princeton. We're going to do a little lunch jazz gig. Hey, we're going to go sit in my buddy's blues band. I'll just grab the AC-15. And then you play your big gig and you have all your stereo stuff. But if you're smart, program your stereo stuff and have a mono version as well or do it, hopefully, that you can just go in the global outset and say change from stereo to mono and make sure all your presets still sound good in mono. Then you just grab one of them as necessary. Hey, Rod McLeod. Sorry, I have to be the bearer of bad news on the Fender Supersonic, especially with the high-pitched squeal. <coughs> if you look at my Fender reissue videos and my Fender Deluxe and, and Blues Deluxe and DeVille videos, you'll, men you'll see that I mentioned two things repeatedly. Those IC brand filter caps fail all the time. Input jacks and pot solder connections like to break on those PCBs. And the Hot Rod and Blues DeVille and Deluxe have 5-watt zeners and 5-watt resistors that are mounted too close to the board. They're in the low-voltage supply. And they burn, and they burn the board. The Supersonic has the same bad filter caps. The Supersonic has the same issues with the PCB uh, solder joints on the pots and the jacks. And they have the exact same low-voltage supply that burns up. And it sounds to me like you might have one or all of those problems. Um, 
So if you have a supersonic, this is a 60 or the whatever, um, I have a video within the last year up on that showing that, and, and I also had a bypass, oh, I, I don't show how, but I, I showed that I bypassed the effects loop and the uh, send return because it was so noisy and, and awful, and it's still not a very good app. Um, but you were given it, so you have uh, no no investment. Open it up, look at the video. If you're not qualified, take it to a tech. Odds are the supersonic needs to be recapped at the very least, probably a whole bunch of solder joints reflowed, and have a tech inspect the low voltage components, the five watt stuff I talked about, because they will toast that board, and once they toast that board, it'll burn a trace, and it's really hard to re put it back together. Hey, Emmett Otter. Say, so we've been going right over an hour. I think we're going to take our first seven-minute intermission, and we'll come back uh, uh, to uh, uh, Cell Zealot's questions. So we'll see you all guys all back in about seven minutes. Thanks.
Hello everybody, I'm back and I will resume the questions. One of the reasons I use this program versus the one I used to use is because the stream stays where I left it. It doesn't zip down on me so I can still see the last question I wanted to get to next. But before I do that, if you guys don't mind, I want to make a minor channel. What's the opposite of a channel announcement? A channel hint of a forthcoming announcement. See these two brown cardboard boxes here. They just arrived, and they're from the Mojo Tone people, who've been very gracious. And uh, 50K subscribers is right around the corner, for which I'm very grateful to you all. We're about 2,500 away from it right now. Um, so it's coming up, um, and uh, I need to be ready. So I've got these boxes from Mojo Tone. Another box from Mojo Tone's coming. A box from Tube Depot is going to be coming. Small box of goodies from Synergy and Friedman is coming. And I'm going to be making something. And the something is not going to be for me. And the something is not going to be sold. Stay tuned. I think everyone's going to be quite chuffed. Tickled, in fact. I think it's going to be a good thing. Anyway, and Brad knows what it is. Brad, don't tell anyone. I see that you're here. Because uh, I got current stream here and where I'm act at behind the stream here. Well, let's get back to it. Uh, let's see. Cell Zealot. Uh, he's not going to plague me with. I don't know what an FB Junior questions are. Huh. But he puts the Tone Tubby Key Largo in it. And, oh, okay. A Blues Junior. Okay. But he went to the Tone Tubby Key Largo speaker. And he clipped the bright cap, and he seems happy. That's good. Uh, hey, Emilio, I had one in. I don't recall what it was. It was something minor. I thought it was okay. It was. It was. It was. It built like the other uh, core uh, Steve Gringrod amps of that era. I didn't think it sounded great. I thought it was. Couldn't decide whether it wanted to be a, a Vox or a Fender, and it wasn't either. But it wasn't something unique. I just thought it was interesting, and it had a like a dual tone blue, you know, two different color blue theme cab that I think the owner loved and I thought it was kind of, mm, whatever. Hey, Rob F., I am well. The coffee fairy is very well. We went out last night and got her a new car and because she forgot her night vision glasses, I was the one who did the, got to drive it home and, and so she's been out driving it, enjoying her new sunroof on this gorgeous day. Curtis Wright asks, have you tried any of Ted Weber's speakers? Any good? I have. I will say that in general, the quality seemed to be a little more consistent when Ted was still running the company, bless his soul. Um, his sons, uh, CJ, I don't know the other guy's name, have been keeping it going. And I've had a few issues with them over the past couple of years, but they've all been resolved it were just issues I never had when Ted was running the place, but when the app and the and the uh, uh, the character of the music calls for it, I do still go to Weber whenever necessary. And I, uh, if it has an issue, I know they'll stand behind it. So more on that to come. I've got that video almost done, like I mentioned. Hey, Jimmy John, I have no experience with uh, Tone King Gremlins. I've only had the Sky King and the Imperial, so um, I, I cannot speculate. And I, I went fuzzy there. I'm, I'm feeling blurry today. Uh, so I hope that they're great. Hey, Vince, uh, Vince, uh, Vinicius, sorry. Yeah, the... Uh, I, I can read really well. I learned it from a book and all, but uh, I've got the screen resolution such that I can just barely see the text on this. If I make it any bigger, then I don't see enough questions at once, etc. Vinicius asks, have you ever played a Hot Rod 52 telly? What is your general opinion on those American vintage guitars? Good custom shop alternatives are not enough to justify the price. Fender is is wonderful and frustrating there are american vintage series um i'm not familiar with the hot rod there are american vintage series which are better than custom shops there are uh, occasional made in japan 
sorry, I'm showing my age, made Mexico strats that um, some things considered are hold their own with the uh, 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 more expensive American standard stuff, not American standard, American vintage stuff. Uh, I'm not a big fan of how the poly finish on the headstocks on some of the made in Mexico stuff kind of gets the wrong kind of patina over time. It, it does weird things sometimes. It kind of shrinks. But, you know, in general, you can find a made in Mexico Strat that the occasional one will be better than many American vintage. And you will find many American vintage that are as good or are better than many custom shops. And I've played some custom shops that are absolute dogs. So if you go to buy a Fender, go play as many as possible. And don't look at the price tag unless you, you just have to stay within a certain range. But try to play everything because you can play 30 and they're all going to be different and one's going to shine and one's going to be a turd and they're going to be sitting right next to each other. They could have consecutive serial numbers. Um, I was at Guitar Center with my son a couple weeks ago. Uh, he wanted to go look at guitars and we were out in that area. So I stopped in and um, he just wanted to, you know, he's just starting out and he's got a little Jackson dinky thing, $200 thing. And he wanted to know about all the different guitars and what they sounded like. Um, but he didn't want to play in front of anyone, so he wanted me to play him for him. So I played him a bunch of guitars. He he, he wants a V uh, or an Explorer because he's real into Hetfield. And I'm like, they're they're cool guitars, man, but unless you're on stage, you don't want a V or Explorer. You can't sit on the couch with a V or Explorer. It's just not ergonomic in the slightest. Worry about that down the road. If you get a gig and you're going to be standing on stage all night, get whatever you want. But um, I played... Uh, four different Fenders. Uh, I played a Squire J. Massis Jazz Master. I played a uh, $900 Made in Mexico Player Strat. I played a Sparkle Green Charvel, which is the Fender these days, San Dimas. And I played, you know, and that was like $1,500. And I played a $2,000 EVH Frankenstein, which is also Fender. And I got to say, the Frankenstein and the Charvel were total dogs, uh, ludicrously heavy, uh, high action, dead, st dead sounding strings. No, they weren't alive. They could probably both be tweaked to be much better guitars, but acoustically they were, they were inert and the, and the Charvel was just a boat anchor. Uh, the player strat was, was pretty good. And that little Jay Massis jazz master, was alive and vibrant and sounded really good. Uh, I'm not a fan of the tunomatic bridge on a jazz master, and I'm not a fan of where the jazz master bridge placement is on a J Massis. I mean, not the bridge with the tremolo. But of those four guitars, from four hundred dollars to two thousand dollar guitars, the only one of those that I would have considered buying was the the Squire. Um, but you could probably find more Charvels and more. EVHs, which are good guitars, and you can find really good s squires. But in one store, in one one-hour sampling, that was my finding. Hey, Sergio, you're in Texas. Okay, I never, I, I don't. When someone has a name of a certain ethnicity, I never assume that they're not American. You know, but yeah, if you were in Guatemala, if you were in Spain. Odds are I can't work on your app. El Paso, we can we can work something out. Get in touch with me. JDS bought the Weller 80 watt. Man soldering on chassis is now so easy. I've been telling people you can't do it with a 40, 50, 60 watt iron, and you don't want to do it with 120 watt iron. That's too much in the other direction. 80 watts is a sweet spot. Weller SP uh, L or SPGL 80. One of those. Put some random sequence of, if you put Weller SPG 80 uh, in Google, if there's an L in there, it'll come up as well. But that's that's the one that I use and I recommend. Um, it's just hard to find replacement tips for them. Come on, Weller. You're supposed to be better than that. Let's see. Which 2x12 cabs would you recommend for Fender 6 uh, G6B and or AV165 Baseman? I am not a fan 
of the uh, of the original baseman cabs and bandmaster cabs from the sixties. Uh, I would get, uh, you know, unless you want it to look like a Fender, and you could probably do it, uh, make it look like a Fender. I would go to Mojo Tone and choose uh, one of their two by twelve cabs. I would get open back, and I would get it pretty much blues breaker dimensions, and see if I'm pretty sure they make you one with the, with the Fender Tolex and and uh, grill cloth. Probably three fifty, three hundred fifty dollars, maybe, maybe four hundred. I'm not really sure. I get I get dealer prices on, on Mojo Tone stuff, uh, so I I don't. I'm not always up on what the going rate is, but you know, the, for the quality, uh, you know, they bought Lopo line a few years back and, and they, their cabinet shop is fantastic and you can choose the dimensions you want, but I would look for a fairly large two by 12 open back. Um, you can have whatever cosmetics, Marshall cosmetics, Fender cosmetics. And, uh, then it's just a matter of finding the speakers that sing to you. Sell zealot. No, it's, it's, it's shave the whales. Thank you. Hey, Frank Glad. Thank you very much for that. He has two Mesa film wars, maybe selling the 100 watt and getting a, a Amp Nation solid SSS, a steel string swinger. Is it swinger or stinger? I never remember. Or a two rock suggestion. Well, uh, you might have missed what I said at the beginning when someone was asking about amp- Amplified Nations and two rocks. I have no experience with Amplified Nations, so I'm, I'm hoping that they're great. Two rocks are very, very good. If that's the sound you're looking for, um, I would choose either over Mesa Fillmore. Um, I mean, the price is very different, but um, if you're going to spend that kind of money on anything, I cannot tell you anything about the Amplified Nation other than I've heard good things about it. I can tell you that two rocks are very well built. So all I can tell you from my information, from my experience, is that the two rock is well built. I suspect the Amplified Nation is. But before you spend $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 on an amp, uh, play it in person. Don't take anyone's internet opinion on uh, as gospel on that, including mine, other than the, the two rock is well built and it's not going to catch on fire. Uh, you have to love it. And um, I would suggest to anyone chasing the Dumble thing, especially with a, a steel string swinger, Make sure you've played one because it is a lot. It is a lot, a lot, a lot. It's very punishing to any deficiency in your playing technique. You will hear everything. And if you if your attack isn't just under control at all the times, it can be kind of a, a wince-inducing experience. There are a lot of really good amps in that same price range that will give different but equally wonderful sounds a lot of the guys chasing steel string swingers are srv nuts stevie ray and yeah he had one and he used it for a little bit but most of that sound is a vibro uh vibro verb uh and a super reverb or some you know one or the other or some combination and in that price range you could get a 60s vibro verb you get a 60s super reverb and get it uh brought up to where it ought to be Make sure you play a bunch of stuff in that range before you choose any. Hey, uh, Fred Federici. Thank you very much. She's in L.A. Uh, Let's see. Michael Leibarger. Thoughts on paying extra cash for the 64 custom deluxe reverb handwire versus 65 deluxe reverb with PCB would be worth extra money for a forever amp. Um, Neither is a forever amp. Uh, but the thing is that the 64 hand wired is no, not going to last any longer than the 65. And the 65, with about $150 worth of work, can last longer than the stock 64. Uh, I'll tell you what, whatever the, ex- the cash difference between the 65 and the 64 is, send to me uh, or burn it or bury it in your yard or give it away to charity because uh, from your perspective, uh you're going to be wasting the money on the 64 hand wire because it is marketing. It's garbage. If you want something in that price range, say $2,400, $2,500, that does what the, the Fender hand wire promises to do, go play the Cerebella before you buy anything. If you can afford a $2,500 amp, play the, you owe it to yourself to play the Cerebella. It is what the Fender promises. It is really, really damn good. Um, 
or look at some of the stuff that Top Hat has. But, you know, I would not pay for that horrible shit show of a, of a, a con job, 64 hand wired stuff. And I would have a hard time paying uh, the new price for a 65 reissue because there's so many used ones in very good condition out there. I think that the uh, buying a used uh, mint condition 65 reissue for 1000 1100 maybe, spending 100 bucks to get uh, the longevity stuff, I've shown that on the channel. It's just moving the hot stuff off the board, heaters and screens. A good tech can do that pretty easily in two hours. And then you have all that money to play with speaker choices. Yeah. And if, if you know, listen to the video I had up a couple of weeks ago where Brian uh, Lindsay was playing his two modded 68 customs. Now, the 68 takes a lot more work to make good than the 65, but um, there was no deficiency of tone present, even they, though they were not originals. Thanks, Robert Hastings. Hey, Rock X. I guess it's Rock X. Could be Rick X. Which 2x12? Okay, with the same. Sorry. So you asked the same question twice, but this time you bribed me. Well, I answered you for free, so ha ha. Joke's on you. Zilla Custom does good stuff if you're in the UK. If And... Um, Amp Cabs Direct, I, I, I tried once, and I, I got a good cabinet from them for very little money, but I thought the, the, um, all the little details are better on the Mojo Tone cabs I've had. Not that there's anything wrong with the Amp Cabs Direct. It's just the Mojo Tone is better for not much more. And if you, if you have a lot of money, you can, you can look into things like Swanson. Jeff Swanson does phenomenal work, uh, but those are going to be a, a different price tier. And it's, it's a lot of nice differences, but you're not necessarily going to hear a difference so much as just know that you you got a roll sitting in your in your living room. Hey, Brendan. I don't know if I'm sharing any wisdom, but uh, I share my attempts at humor at least. Yeah, the the vintage club series are are, are sleeper amps. I have no experience with the single-ended uh, VC uh, 508. Sorry. I would hope that it is designed by the same guy. Uh, you know, because if you look inside one of those things, you're like, all right, good Wema box caps, uh, radial caps used properly. Uh, you know, there are things done to meet the budget, but it's got 16 millimeter uh, pots on the board, not nine millimeter. You know, it doesn't have the little plastic D shaft things that you know, a lot of companies did at the time. So. I hope that the SE version of, of the VC series is good, but I have not played around with it. Hey, Robert Schmalzbach. Uh, yeah, in fact, I had a uh, uh, the first video on this Victoria, the Victoria Ivy League, I put up about a week ago. I uh, showed that same issue from nothing, 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 and then on. Uh, in this one, I put in uh, Alpha. 24 millimeter, three eighths inch bushings, one meg audio taper for the volume. Um, and the Alpha does a really good job. You know, people think the CTS is better. The Alpha functionally is performs better in my experience. Uh, and if, if it fails, it's $1.50, $2. But it, I've not had very many failures um, in them. And they work, you know, that you can clean them just as easily as a CTS. Um, the only time I would not use an alpha is if you have an amp where the uh, ground connection is made through the shell of the uh, pot. In this Victoria, at least, none of the grounds are made through the shell of, of you know, the pot casing. They're all made directly to the chassis or wired. Um, so um, now it depends on the model. Um, the original of the Harvard, which is what this is based on, had a linear volume and a linear uh tone. Uh, this one had audio for both. I retained the audio for the volume because this amp has uh, enough gain because it doesn't have two channels, it doesn't have the mixer stage, that even at the low range of the volume pot, there's quite significant output. And with the alpha audio taper, it's a nice transition from nothing to on. You don't get that nothing, nothing, nothing. Whoa, it's on! Um, but I changed the uh, tone pot to linear because that's what Leo designed it to be because with the audio pot 
all the highs were bunched up over at three o'clock. And so you, you know, nothing, nothing. Whoa, and now it's bright. And so there's a real narrow range. Now with the linear, pretty much from two o'clock to 10 o'clock is the range you're kind of play around with most of the time. So it's harder to get the extremes. And that'll be in the video that I put up on that one soon. You, you can replace them yourself if you have soldering experience. Um, but if you don't, amps are not the thing to, to learn on because there's so many things that can go wrong. Uh, Victoria, as far as changing a speaker in there and changing a volume pot, you just remove the rear panel. They're very easy to service. If you're not, the fact that you would ask that question makes me think that you might not have enough experience to do it and do it well and know that you will not cause any issues. That would be one hour for any good tech to do that for you. It, it'd be money well spent to protect your investment. Uh, if you, I don't know what Jensen, uh, the uh, 2112 comes with. Some Jensen's are great, some Jensen's not so much. Yeah, Matt Fields is agreeing with me on the 64 custom. It, it's 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 hard because, you know, lots of YouTube channels like that pedal show, and they're really nice guys, but they recommend it. And I think they're a little outside their I think they're a little outside their their, their scope on that. Um and you know, nothing against the guys. They're going by what everyone says and they sound okay, but you know, like the 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 deluxe, 64 deluxe it's custom tremolo. It's not a custom tremolo. They can't sell the the, the damn uh, LDR Roach in Europe. So instead of using the old uh, Opto trim that a Deluxe Reverb has, they put in the bias trim from a Princeton because you don't have to use the the, uh, the stuff that you can't sell in Europe. And so now it's custom. It's not a custom. It's a workaround. It's a cheap ass workaround, and it doesn't sound like a Deluxe Reverb anymore. It may be the right sound for you, but it's not the right sound for the name on the on the tin. Hey, let's see here. McFat says, "Hey, I got a recently got a trainer YCS 100H2 with matching 4x12 cab. I'm confused about the parallel outputs on the back mono stereo switching cab. Thoughts on this amp? Almost too much going on for me. I am not familiar with that amp. Sorry. I would assume, unless it is a stereo amp." Uh, that is just you have more than one output on the back, one of which is probably you know, the parallel outputs. In case you're using more than one cabinet, one of which is probably labeled as the primary or main use first, uh, and the and then your cab has got a switch that can go from stereo or mono wiring, so you could use one speaker output on the back of the amp into your cab set to mono, and you make sure the impedance matches, or you can use you could use both outputs of that amp into the two inputs on the cab set to stereo, but be no benefit because each one would be getting the same signal unless the amp is stereo, but I am not familiar with the YCS100H2. Um, I would contact uh, your local Canadian uh, amp tech and find, a, <laughs> I don't know whether you're in Canada, but most trainer experts are. Uh, or maybe later I'll, I'll be nice and I'll look, I'll look that up for you. And I'll let you know on the, in the comments. Yeah, and in addition to the, the Sir Bella in that same price range, like Matt Field says, uh, you, you can get a 70s Deluxe Reverb and two to $400 will probably get it to, you know, like time travel. It's 1972 again. And those are really good apps. Even if the 72s, the 73s, 74s aren't perceived in the market as being as good as a 66, compared to most of the stuff on the market today, they're amazing. I mean, they're really damn good. Oops. Hey, uh, Peter Van Baller. Ba I was sorry, I went weird on that. That's that's a Dutch name. I went kind of like drunk French on you. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, Peter. I, I'm terrible with some Dutch names. I'm trying. He's got a Princeton Reverb clone with a DC on the volume pot. He's got Crackle Fest. He checked the tone caps and they're not leaking. Where should I look next? Could this be DC on the eyelet board? It very much could be. And if they use fiberboard like, uh, like old fenders, it probably is. If you have DC on the volume pot, though, if it's not 
if you have DC on the, your guitar volume pot, that's DC on the input. If you have just DC on the volume pot on the amp, it's is it present on the treble and bass with the volume but midway? If you have the volume midway and you still have crackle on the treble and bass, then you have DC um, in the uh, uh, tone stack area of the board. If it's not in the treble and bass when the volume is up, but as you turn the volume down, you hear crackle, then you could have uh, one of three things happening. Uh, because that, that volume pot is the gridly resistor for uh, uh, V1B. You could have a noisy pot. It could be a dirty pot. It could be a failing pot where it's not giving a good connection, therefore it's not functioning as a good grid leak resistor. You could have a bad triode in V1, in which case you change out V1. You could have a bad cathode um, uh, uh, resistor in V1, or you could have a, also, though less likely, be a, a, a failing cathode bypass cap there. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, we need to find out whether the crackle is also present on treble and bass, in which case it's coming from the preceding stage, or if it's only on the volume, it's the, the subsequent stage, or the pot itself. But yeah, it could be DC. Well, actually, it wouldn't be DC on the board if, if it's the last, if it's, if it's the, the next stage. Uh, the wire goes from the volume pot directly to the grid of the tube, so that takes the, the board out of the, the, the equation there. People are talking about rum raisin, so we're way behind in the chat. Hey, JDS says, the 1K resistor connected to the multi-section can on my 77 champ is toast. We'll replace with a metal oxide one. I was wondering if there's a better choice between 2 watts or 3 watts. Well, oh, whoa there, champ. Uh, 1 watt or higher is fine. You, you can use 1 watt or 2 watt or 3 watt, your choice. But something caused that to burn, most likely. You need to make sure you don't have a failing section in that, in that can. You may make sure you don't have a failing tube or something else, strong excessive current. Um, as a good test, if you don't have any other test equipment, put a half watt in there. And don't play. A half watt will be fine in that position if you're not playing. But if it immediately goes up in smoke, you got something wrong with the filter cap or something else, probably the filter cap. It could be the output tube screen supply. And it's much better to, you know, do it with a, with a new half watt resistor way up in the air. So if, if it burns, it doesn't burn the board. But it's much better to lose a five cent resistor than a two dollar resistor. So uh, it, it, it's possible sometimes that an old one watt resistor just got toasted over the years and there's nothing else wrong in the app. But be sure before you start f either feeding it new sacrificial resistors or you have a problem that a three watt doesn't show you that a one watt would. You need to make sure that that current draw is not excessive. Hey there. Tasty tone, yeah. Uh, he's got two, hey, you got two sixty fives come back Alnicos. Uh, if you have a fifty watt amp and one one of those speakers fails, uh, odds are the other one will be okay for a little while. You know, you're right at the edge, but probably be okay. You'd hear a, a volume drop, and so you'd say, "Hey, what 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 changed?" And you'd say, "Oh shit, that speaker's gone." Um, it'd be unlikely if one for one to fail. If you have two 65 watt amp, uh, sorry, 65 watt speakers with a 50 watt amp, unless you have them wired in series, parallel is better for that reason, because in a series, uh, one can get more of the wattage than the other, and that can be problems. But I think with two 65 watts comebacks, you should be okay, regardless of series parallel. Uh, Bark, I think the Japanese is just a little bit prettier. I don't think it's going to play any different or sound any different. I think you get uh, prettier wood uh, and you get the more split inlays. It's, I don't, I would rather have 
uh, the Indonesian Rev Star and the and the, say, say I wanted to go get two new guitars, I'd rather have a Rev Star and say a PRS DGT from the eight hundred fifty dollar range than to have a Japanese Rev Star and nothing else. Um, you know, I don't think the extra. It's not two grand extra. It's it's about a thousand bucks extra though, which is still not insignificant. Hey there, Wes. Alex, good on you, Matt. Enjoyed your 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 view, uh, stream the other night there with Mr. Jace. Hey, let's see. I like that people are talking to each other and and that we have a some kind of kooky little community going on here. I got two thumbs down. Mm, two thumbs down. I assume that's not from any of you guys. Um, hey, Matt Johnson, thank you so much, man. Hey, he's getting married. Congratulations. Everyone congratulate Matt. He's off to New Orleans. Uh, wait, you're going. You're getting married. You're going to go to New Orleans for your honeymoon. And you get this guy here who goes to New Orleans twice a year for the last 15 years and cooks. And, and you want to ask me about plate followers and cathode followers? Really? Is that how you want to use your time? And she's marrying you? Yeah, sonic difference between plate follower versus a cathode, uh, pros and cons of each. Uh, cathode follower is capable of driving a, a load much better, more efficiently than a plate follower. And what, that's going to mean two things that matter to, to guitarists. Cathode follower loses less gain in the tone stack, so the app with the cathode follower has more gain if everything else is equal. Uh, second of all, the feel is very different. Cathode followers with that efficient feel, um, it feel you know you can you can t if you've been doing this while you can tell the difference. A plate driven tone stack at high gain can be very hard. It can be very splatty. Um, it can get fizzy, not fizzy in sound, but fizzy in feel. Is there? There's a better way of expressing this, but um, it's not occurring to me. There are ways around that. Like if you have a AC15 Custom Classic where they have the Vox tone stack, but it's plate driven instead of cathode driven, you can put a little 500 picofarad cap across the, the plate resistor for that stage. It takes some of that high end uh, nails on the blackboard out of it. That, you know, with the Vox tone stack, it's an extreme. You don't really notice it with a fender because there's not a lot of gain and it's a very different tone stack. But if you do a plate, if you were to do say it's 1984 and say I'm gonna take out the cathode follower in my Marshall so I can use that triode for more gain I'll just drive it with a plate it can be hard sounding it can be it's a, it, some people will love it but it's a is not the same sound as what we ex expect from Marshall um, from a designer's perspective you you typically use a cathode follower for a tone stack or you use it to drive a, a, an effects loop if you want a low impedance effects loop where you want it to be low impedance and you want it to drive uh, a load so you can save a total 80 foot run for send return on your loop and not have any degradation. Um, you know, but it is definitely uh, uh, something done for gain. It's interesting to me that the, the 5F6A basement, which is kind of the one that you know, it's, I don't think it's the first one with a cathode follower, but Fender chose a cathode follower for that tone stack, and they could easily have used easily have used a plate driven, and the amp would have had less gain, but no one would have known because Fenders were designed to stay clean. It would have been, in some ways, a better design from Fender for for a Fender if they had done a plate driven tone stack and just used had an unused triode there, but they didn't. They did a cathode follower, and so we get the the 58 59 60 basement which gives us the, all of marshall so yay to leo's weird mistake let's see oh kimball oh I, I hate to tell you this don't don't waste 60 a7s in an origin 50 you can't do anything with the bias in that amp anyway. Um, if you if you bias it warmer, the uh, the uh, 
power transformer probably can't handle the current. If you bias it colder, the tubes probably, you know, it's just, it's just. I hate to be this way, but don't waste 60A7s in an Origin 50. You won't hear a damn bit of improvement. The amp's got too many, it just has too many fundamental flaws. It, you can use it as a pedal platform. But if you're using it for a pedal platform, the output section is going to stay clean. So you're not going to hear any difference between a 60, a 7, and a 34, and a 6L6 anyway. Um, it's just an unpleasant app, and there are better pedal platforms. And I'm sorry that Marshall spent so much money marketing it as, as Plexi Sounds, because it's, it's just Plexi-esque cosmetics. The circuit has nothing in common with any Marshall made before 1983. Um uh, there are other people who give you nicer answers, uh, answers you're going to be happier to hear, but that's the truth. Sixty-eight. Se- if you have a set of sixty-eight sevens, they're they're worth more than the Origin Fifty. Get a real Marshall or Marshall style amp to put them in, where you, where you'll hear them. You'll get your money's worth for them. I mean, it'd be like putting racing tires on a Yugo. That might be a bit extreme, but not by much. Here goes my third dislike. Thank you, Rodney. Hey, Wes, send away. It doesn't have to be a sixty-seven. I'll, 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 I'll slum for you and work on a sixty-six if you want, or even a, an, uh, a sixty-five. Some of the early ones. <laughs> this, that. <coughs> Welcome to my life. Yeah. A lot of a lot of companies out there install speakers and install rear panels before the paint is all the way dry. If I get an AC15 in with with a stuck speaker like that, I go get a very thin uh, paint knife, uh, painter painter's knife, and I just kind of slide it in from the side. You know, a thin flexible one. You can use a plastic one. You can use a metal one. But you just need some, once you break the seal, it'll come up. But you just you gotta break the seal, and you may lose a little bit of gasket, and uh, you just hope hope that you you don't, um, because someone wanted to get that amp out that day. I'm a big fan of the AC15 C1, but that doesn't mean that I'm a big fan of everything factories do uh but yeah you've if you I, I don't put that stuff on the channel because it makes for a real boring video but I'll, i have a little bitty thin flexible painter's knife and it'll kind of slide in and you try it at a different angle different angle you'll get it in there mcfats i'm sorry i don't have any opinion on a prowler versus a, a pv bravo um uh, if the prowler has got a broken uh, uh, input jack, some of those old PVs you can't get the original parts for anymore. Um, I don't know which which style of input jack the prowler used. Some of them you can replace the, the old proprietary or board mounted jack with a switchcraft or a carling, not carling, uh, cliff with wires. Some of them you can't, but some many of those amps. Uh, that's what supports the PCB. So if you replace the, you know, you replace three pots and replace a jack, then you've got two pots holding the whole thing on. That's not good either. So um, I wouldn't buy either unless you could open them up. And unless you know what you're looking at, you're taking a risk. I'm sorry. Hey, Chuck McFarley. Yeah. Um, well, th- that was a. Uh, that, that weird 5E8A Tweed Twin. And they they that amp does not have as much gain as other later 5F models, um, like the 5F8A, whatever it is. Um, and so the amp inherently does not have as much gain as other tweeds. And so it was designed with linear taper pots, but it, that one came with audio. And so the audio was working against you know, you just didn't have anything at all until you were above noon on an audio taper pot. But above noon on an audio taper pot is nine o'clock on a linear. So linear taper pots let the the owner use the rain the gain range that was actually available from the circuit. Five B three deluxe is very different. It's got a lot more gain. You can use a linear. The originals did, 
but a lot of guys find that it's too loud, too fast for the linear. So you can use an audio or you can use a J taper, which is right in between the two, 25, 30% taper versus 10% versus 50%. Hey, here's something I, I don't think any people discuss people discuss often enough. What are we talking about with 10%, 50%, 30%, 20% taper pots? Let's see if I can show you the let me let me get a pot. I'll just use this knob. All right. Can you guys see that that set screw coming out of that knob? All right, so let's see. From your perspective, that's on 10. Uh, that's on zero. This is a terrible demonstration. I'll do a video on this. I'll put this in a, in a video. Anyway, imagine you've got a, a pot like that with a knob like that on it, but the knob's got a line. So all the way off is, is uh, 5 o'clock, is 7 o'clock. All the way on is 5 o'clock. Noon is right up the middle. Noon on a uh, linear taper pot that's a 50% taper pot. So noon is halfway. So if it's a 500k pot, you got 250k here, you got 250k here. Let's do a thousand, let's do a one meg. It's easier math for me. So 500k, 500k. That same noon position on a 10% audio taper pot is 10%. So you would have 900k here, you would have 10k here. Sorry, 100k here, 900k here. So you're 10% of, of the pot's maximum when you're at noon. So 10% to zero, 900K to full. If you have a 30% taper pot, noon is 30%. So you would have 300K here and 700K here. So you have 900K, 700K, or 500K. From audio, 10%, to J, to linear. And on this side, with linear, you'd have 500K. Then you'd have 300K for, for J, and then you'd have... 100K for audio. So that's what those taper numbers and figures mean. I hope that helps someone. And I hope if you all know that, just tell me, shut up. I'll, I'll go away. But, you know, it's, it's weird. I never know what people know versus what they don't. Seth, your buddy has a swart that gets nasty buzz, but only when he plays B or C chords. Any ideas? Thanks. That can be a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, that 69 Deluxe Reverb the other day had a buzz if I played a, uh, an A um, and, and almost any octave below the, 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 the B string. And uh, it turned out that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the wood on the baffle and the uh, cleat had expanded and contracted to different rates. And so a screw that used to be tight was slightly loose, just slightly. And the dress washer behind that screw would vibrate a little bit, but only on A notes. It could be that, could be a tube, could be a solder joint. Uh, but contact Michael Swart. Uh, he's going to know that app inside out. It, you know, but the first thing to do is just carefully open it up and make sure all the screws and hardware that you can access are tight. Beyond that, if you're not a tech, talk to Michael and he'll, he'll probably tell you the same stuff I'm telling you, but he might have some specifics on that particular model. Preamp tubes, output tubes, and hardware are usually the causes. Hey, Jeremy Green. Um, for a backup, uh, I wouldn't carry a tube amp for a backup because you're, it's a big, heavy, you know, it's a small, heavy thing that, that's fragile. Does uh, Boss have a head version of the Katana for every, every, for every reason that makes more sense to me? Um, people love their quilters, too, though I've not tried one. Milkman's got a thing, yeah. They might be up your alley. Um, Matt Fields agreeing with me about the uh, origin, getting the tube up, upgrade. Hey, the goose, uh, the goose chase music. I don't have a ton of experience with with many German apps, Diesel and Engel, because there just aren't that many being used here in the middle of the states. Yeah, you know, I'm sure that they have a, a bigger market presence in New York and L.A maybe Chicago, but in Memphis, I just don't see anyone using them. Um, so I've, I've had a few in, and uh, but I've had a few in of different price range because neither company uh, has just one tier of pricing. So 
I don't know that I've had enough of a representation of either company. I do know a lot of my uh, tech friends who are in Europe aren't a big fan of Ingalls. A lot of players are, but a lot of the techs I know are not. But I don't, I don't want to speak for them. McFats, yeah, I'm not a big fan of most lunchbox amps. I'm definitely not a fan of the box night train. I'm not a huge fan of the orange ones. The uh, Vic- the victory ones are pretty pretty damn good, but they cost an awful lot. And with any or- lunchbox amp, you know, what's the number one thing that fails in amps? Tubes. What's the hardest thing in the world to access to change in a lunchbox amp? The tubes. And so you're on stage, you got to remove eight t- or twelve tiny little screws. Good luck not dropping them and have them disappear into the dark. And they're really hard to get on and off without scratching the paint. And the screws like to strip because they're just, uh, very rarely are they machine screws. They're usually sheet metal screws. I think it's cutesy. I think it's kitschy. I think it is a, uh, I think they're overstating the problem so that they can have a solution. Um, So, Michael Moore, I've never tried to get a Roland Microcube schematic. I mean, the damn thing is a computer inside. I don't have a schematic for my iPhone either. Um, So... Hey, Brad's, you know, I already acknowledge Brad's here, but I'm saying hey because he's entering in my real time here uh, or whatever my fake real time is on this. Let's see. Magisterium, you're Sergio Ribeiro. Sorry, I studied Spanish, so Portuguese just slaps me upside the face. Ribeiro, is that correct? Tell me yes or no or to shut up. Well, Sergio, you are welcome. And uh, it's okay if we have more than one Sergio. We just can't have more than one Lyle, or at least it's statistically improbable. Hey, Grandpa Grinch, take care, man. Man, Scott, you didn't have to do that, but it's much appreciated. Did you... Were you here at the beginning, Scott? Did you get to hear me go through the pickup positions on your Rev Star? You'll get to hear it for real, though, in the real video with the real mic and all, but I gave you a little sneak peek of that. Thanks, Lauren Billington. I appreciate that. I, I, I'm not McFats. I'm not a big fan of no load uh, pots uh, for tones. Uh, you can do it if you want, but I have yet to play a Strat or Tele where I thought that needs to be brighter. I, I need can can we can we make it brighter? I'm one of the weirdos who actually uses the tone pot on a Fender. I'll turn it down to like seven and go there. That's that's the thing. That's the balance. But hey. I want this part to be brighter, then I can go to 10. But I never think, brighter still. You got to sharpen those nails before you approach the blackboard. Hey, Mario V. Um, No, ask as many questions as you want, guys. I just can't answer all of them in in one three-hour session. Though I notoriously try, and we're coming up on this second intermission too, but... um, Sound aside, what's the best designed amp I've seen? That's a good question. People are going to think I would say high watt. It's not high watt. High watt's got some ground loops built into them, or the classic DR series. Harry Joyce was the guy I was trying to think of the last time we did this. Um, and he has beautiful RAF looms, but he inherited some bad notions about grounding. They're fairly easy to fix, though. Um, I would say, honestly, while nothing is ever perfect, I would say a 64 or 65 example of any Fender reverb app. The first ones where they were real, you know, with a nickel-plated chassis they were gorgeous 
the wiring was perfect. They were there. there. Th- those were the the best years for Fender, sixty four and sixty five. Leo had already sold the company in sixty five, but it was still his handpicked team there, and I think he was still on site for a lot of that. You know, nothing's perfect, but here it is, fifty, sixty years later, and they all still work, and they can be brought back. You know, uh, if if people take care of them, there's no reason. If you get one of those amps, if you're lucky enough to have a, now let's say 64, because some of them are starting 64. If you have a 64 through 65, early 66 Fender, and you baby it, and it's always been babied, if you have what I call generational service done every 20 years, just the stuff that Leo expected to, to wear out, the filter caps, make sure all the tubes are good, make sure everything's clean and tight. There's no reason uh, that they can't outlast us all. So are there more innovative things out there? Are there things that get different sounds? Yeah, but uh, that classic era, and it's a small window, two, three years, of Fender is about as good as anyone has ever consistently made, consistently made. Oh, Magisterium, Sergio, I'm not, I'm not finicky about guitar conservation. I mean, if it's not my guitar, like Scott's guitar is there, I'm, I'll try not to drop anything on it. But uh, all my guitars get wear marks. Uh, I don't want a relic. I never want a relic to guitar. I, you know, that's the that, um, pink exotic is still here. Uh, Brian's not picked it up yet. And that's the only thing I don't like about the exotics is that they, they do the faux relicking. I, I, I think it's crass. I think it's ridiculous. I like I like to say, yeah, it was that time I dropped uh, that thing on the guitar. That was that time that uh, it fell off the amp at that, at that stage, whatever. And my guitars just get dings. Let me grab my, my, my oldest. Well, not my oldest, but my oldest electric. Now that I've got all the better camera stuff, one day I'll get out my Southern Jumbo. You can see all the uh, crackle on the lacquer. But this is that Eric Johnson that you see in all the videos. And it's just covered in ding and dings and finger marks, you know, finger marks. And it's got, you know, it got set down on something there. And it's got scuffs here. You can tell I don't have a big belt buckle. Thank God it's not the night. 1970s anymore but this thing is far from pristine but it's still in pretty good shape you know it doesn't look like a relic guitar but here's the thing this is from 2005 this is uh nitro it's thin nitro from 2005 i play this all the time i've played it live i've taken it to people's houses i've loaned it out to people it has had a lot of wear and it's almost 20 years old now and it does not look at all like a relic guitar um it's beginning to get some wear through the finish on the fretboard just a little bit it is a phenomenal guitar there are many examples of real ones from the 50s and 60s that in the 70s and 80s looked more like this I see, have seen very, very few originals look at all like what most relic strats look like, especially the ones now. People are doing all these things where it's like it was white, but then it's worn away to show a sunburst beneath, and it's just, man, it, it looks like a Rorschach guitar. It doesn't look like any, or it doesn't look like very many of the vintage guitars I've actually seen, and I've I've, I've been doing this a while. I've, I've followed that. The things that look like that are few and far between. It's like... Uh, you know, Stevie Ray's was played to death. Roy Gallagher's was played to death. Most 59, 60 strats don't end up like that. They look a little bit closer to this. So I, I, I'm not precious about it. I'm careful. You know, if I'm, if I have a lot of amps out here at once, or I think there's any chance of tripping, the 335 stays up on the wall, and I grab a telly or a strat to have, you know, on a stand where I'm working because 
What the hell's gonna go wrong with the telly? Or strap. In fact, my bass just got it a, a new ding because uh, dropped a transformer on it. Let's see. Hey, Eagle Ray Rob, I don't know any big wad, uh, big wad of jamps that use octal preamp sections. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that I agree with you about the touch, sensi touch, sensi yeah, touch sensitivity, sound and feel of the octal preamp tubes, because a lot of times the values in those circuits are with octals are very different than the values in comparable novels. So from the musician's perspective, the difference might be octal versus novel. From the tech's perspective, oh, this is the sound of a, a triode being run with 200 volts uh, plate, you know, uh, 200 volts uh, B plus and uh, a 470 ohm, 470K plate resistor and no cathode bypass cap versus the novel being run with 300 volts on the B plus and 100K and 1.5K cathode that's bypassed with a 25 microfarad. And so they're going to sound totally different just by all those other variables. Even if, even if the triode inside the octal versus the novel had the same moo and gain factor and all that. Um, so I have not seen any octal circuits where the values and the circuits surrounding them, using them, was the same as a comparable novel. So, man, you can look at Gibson and you can look at Ampeg, the Re Reverber Rocket 2. There are like three or four versions. They're all called Reverber Rocket 2. They all came out in the same couple of years. They use the same tubes in different sequences, and the schematics are all over the map. Uh, one of them uses the, the BK11, one of them uses something else. And if someone from the outside would say, well, the BK11 sounds like this, and the other model with the other tube sounds like this, well, it's not because it's a BK11 versus the other two, it's because they change all these other things too. I'm not putting you down or dismissing you or be like, oh, I know better than this guy. I'm just sharing a perspective that not a lot of people think about. All right. Uh, McFats wishes his finishes were indestructible. Um, my guitars still look better than I do, so. Um, I'm going to do one more question here from David James, and we're going to take another seven minutes. Uh, is it possible to have a bias vary trim on bigger bottle tubes work well and be reliable? It is possible to do. It is rarely done. Um, reli reliability doesn't come into it so much that um, traditionally a bigger bottle tube has a larger output transformer which can handle, can do a larger frequency range. It's, it's, it's harder to dial out some of the thumps and thuds, not that people always dial out thumps and thuds with 6v6s and such. Um, but the main uh, thing that you don't want, the reason you don't hear that is the if you're actually varying the bias... What's best we put this? The the re the reasons you would want a larger power tube to begin with, as far as the feel and response, are going to uh, not be there typically in a bias trim circuit. I'm trying to decide how far down this rabbit hole to go. I you know I got the sense when I had Dave on a couple uh, three weeks ago. That when he said, "Well, we'll I'll tell more about what Class A is," and he was, I think he would thought I didn't know because I didn't go into the whole operates for 100 percent of the of the swing of the tube thing. Um, I, I'm, I'm I'm always debating how techy to be because if I, there's a fine line between uh, simplifying just enough and oversimplifying. It might be to a degree as well as just taste the music changed and people wanted um, a more exaggerated tremolo. But yeah, it's possible to have a, a bias very trim with larger tubes. 
uh, and be reliable. It's just not something that most people seem to want. People, people seem to want to have a different sounding tremolo with big loud amps, maybe because all the artifacts that are there in most bias trims become more objectionable at louder uh, volumes. Um, but at that note, it is time to take another seven minute break and I'll see you guys in just a little bit.
Hey, a couple things before we get back to the questions. Um, some people commented uh, critically on the interview I did with Dave Friedman and then on the interview I did on Jason Tong's channel um, that they felt I was being rude and disrespectful to Dave and to Jason. And uh, curious to me, Brad, that none of them thought I was being rude to you. Anyway, um, I reached out to Jason and, and to Dave, and they were they were totally cool. Uh, uh, they didn't feel that way. Um, in fact, uh, Dave had some colorful things to say about those who might, but uh, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, I want you guys to know a couple of things about the approach I take to those interviews and some things that aren't obvious. Let's do, start with those first. First of all, there's always a lag. So if you and I are talking together face-to-face, over a beer or coffee or whatever, we're not interrupting each other. We're saying, yeah, oh man, that happened to me too. You know, just giving feedback to show that I'm engaged with what you're saying. But when there's a slight lag, they pause a slight bit and you're like, yeah, tell me more. But because there's a lag, they're st- they're st- by the time I say, yeah, tell me more, they've already started to say the next thing. And so on to one degree, on one hand, I am trying to learn to adjust for that because it's a new situation for me. I've never had remote interviews be a thing in my life and you have to adjust your timing like being a comedian. Uh, So some of that is just down to misfiring, misalignment because it becomes a little unnatural with, with any kind of delay, even just a few, like 30 milliseconds, those, the natural rhythm off. Second of all, these are not formal interviews. I'm not on fresh air. Uh, we're not talking about deep, serious subjects. These are a bunch of guys who, you know, Dave and I know each other. Jason and I know each other. You, you see uh, J- Brad, one of, my, one of my best buds, you know, and, and everyone in the community gets to know each other. And you're talking shop. You're hanging after work or whatever. And it's 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 more like meeting up at the pub and just, just chatting away. Um is supposed to be a little bit informal. So if anyone's offended, uh, the people being interviewed were not, but I am working on my delivery and the timing aspects of things. I want to be good at, at doing this, but it's not, when I, we get to do it once a month, it's not something you just, oh, okay, I got to wait. I got to jump in faster. I got to predict what they're saying so I can get into the gap. And then I got to wait a little bit more. You can see us start to say something and say, no, no, you go ahead. Um, The other thing is that, you know, uh, the other two guys are a little more introverted than I am. Um, And I try to dial back my exuberance. I'm sorry. And some people just don't like me and whatever. Uh, That's not news to me. I'm 52. I I learned that a long ass time ago. Um, Second of all, on the subject of relicking, I was looking at the current chat comments while having a think stick. And um, people are like, I love Relic and I love my Relic guitars. If you love them, great. Uh, it's just not for me. I find a lot of times it's extreme. Yeah, Matt, the, the solid colors over sunbursts are real, but it's rare to see big, big balding patches. <clears throat> but on that note, my telly, which is there in the back, it's disassembled while I'm waiting for some pickups. When I had that thing built, uh, a buddy of mine finished it in nitro. Pardon me. And he was just starting out with with getting that equipment, and that finish has not aged well. It's beginning to green a little bit, and a lot of orange peel has appeared over the past two years, and little speckles where the where I guess the uh, the spray gun wasn't doing it evenly. And I want to get it refinished. So if anyone knows a really good uh, guitar finisher who works in nitro, thin nitro, um, uh, let me know, because I don't know everyone in the industry, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have dealt with people. Uh, I want to get, I don't want it to be a relic thing or an age thing. I want it to be like, hey, this is how it was made in 1952 as it left the factory, and it will then age like a real 52. Uh, lastly, I'm not going to be able to get through all the questions today. There are already so many. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit more selective. And if you don't get your question answered this time, I will try to get you next time. I'm going to try to go to the things that aren't as uh, easily Googleable, maybe. Let's see here. And I'll try not to go off any on any more tangents, so I, no promises. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 
Matt Fields has been doing the same pots chase that I have. Let's see. Wes Chilton, yeah, I loved your, your demo reel. Um, though it's not fair to everyone else who didn't get to see it, but yeah, it's amazing what you do and the uh, possibilities of what you can do. Rob Chafee, that was the guy in Ohio. Yeah, I'm sure Brad's probably, yep, there, Brad popped it in there. Um, there's another company, Vintage some vintage sound that, that does pots, but they're out of stock as well. Sorry, I'm, I'm all over the place. Uh, by the way, if anyone is asking amp question stuff and, and Brad or Matt Fields is answering them, 99.9999% of the time, I agree with them completely. And where I, I disagree, we're not really disagreeing so much as, uh, as theoretical stuff of interest only to geeks like us. Let's see. I must have been in a in a uh, intermission while these comments were going up there. And to anyone who's done a super chat that I've not gotten to yet, I will. On other channels, um, let's see. On other channels. Super Chats get answered pretty much immediately, but they have producers funneling the Super Chats to the host, so to speak, and I'm not there. So Michael Moore, Vox AC 15 C1, good, one day, next, nope, LED on, tubes glow, no sound, output transient spec, uh, burnt 5-watt 1K resistor, at RA, uh, still nope. Uh, uh, the 1K resistor in there it, it takes the place of the choke, if that resistor is getting very, very hot, I mean, it's supposed to get pretty hot. Uh, if you don't have sound, uh, you could have a bad uh, output tube, and it's just drawing the screen supply too much, which is what's on the other side of that 5K, one, one, 5 watt 1K resistor. But that amp has um, an HT fuse, and it has uh, the external mains fuse, and I think it has a heater fuse as well. Uh, if you have no sound, but the tubes are glowing, your heaters are working, but you could have a, a blown HT fuse, so you have no sound, or you could have that and or probably both, if you have a blown HT fuse, a bad EL84, which would explain both no sound and maybe why that resistor is getting very hot. Very is not a quantifiable amount, and it is normal for that resistor to get hot to the touch, but not too hot for that resistor itself or the surrounding components. Uh, the Vox AC15C1 and AC30C2 and the X variants are very good amps that ship with very inexpensive tubes that have traveled several thousand miles before you get them. So when I get one of those in, the first thing I tell the owner is, great, let's get some real tubes. So that's probably what's going on with you. Curtis Wright, I don't, uh, if you're going to uh, replicate the uh, SAG of rectifier tube with diodes, you want to use uh, resistors. And find the AC15C1 schematic or the AC15, I'm sorry, AC30C2 schematic. You can see where Vox used, I think they're uh, 82 ohm 5 watt resistors in series with the HT connections before the diodes. And that gives both the voltage drop of a rectifier tube and uh, the sag that you get. But that way, instead of having one big 10 or 20 watt resistor on the output of the diodes on the DC, you have two relatively small resistors on the AC. And for a host of reasons, that's better. It's less heat and because they're sharing the load and AC is more forgiving to work with in this case than DC. Um, and as the current uh, requ requested by the app increases the current provided by the through those resistors will drop a little bit and that's how you get the uh, much much inflated notion of sag especially in a cathode bias stamp where they pretty much are always sagging or never sagging depending on how you look at it uh, yeah brad needs to raise his prices Thanks on the rocks. Appreciate that. 
Damon Bates, thank you. I'm glad that, that uh, your tech was able to get the, your your Hot Rod Deluxe going well. Hey, Christopher Butler. Ah, bah, t- and humbug to you too. Uh, I, I miss beginnings of things all the time. I, sometimes I miss endings. Good to see you, man. Uh, yeah, I don't have the schematic in front of me, but if Brad says his R80, probably, and he's saying the same thing I'm saying. Hey, McFats, thank you so much, mate. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you got if you got a tech arguing against making sure the filter caps are working and who doesn't know how a ground switch works. Lou Woods asks, a Fryat LX2? I don't know. A Fryat LX2 or not a Fryat LX2? That is the question. I'm unfamiliar with, with uh, Steve's LX2 model. Uh, I would imagine that it's very, very good, though. Oops, wrong button. Kellen 707. I'm sorry, I, I'm unfamiliar with Ames amps, uh, but you need to look at the circuit that's driving the, the bulb um, and make sure that the, you know, if it's done by a solid state, whether the, the uh, swing there is strong enough, if it's a, driven by a tube, try a different tube, make sure all the conditions for the tube are right, all the voltages. Hopefully, all that stuff is on the schematic. Uh, you could have a, a, a dead um, uh, or failing bulb, though it's not as common. The, th- the things that fail typically in the Fender version of that same circuit, which is similar, and it's got to be similar in some ways, is you can have uh, a capacitor in the LFO, which is failing, which lessens the oscillation so that it becomes weak. You can have a bad tube. You could have a bad cathode resistor or plate resistor on the, on the oscillator tube or the driver tube, though that's more rare. Uh, you could have a failing cathode bypass cap if present, which will decrease gain. And the LDR portion of the roach often dies, in which case it doesn't matter what the bulb is doing, the LDR is not going to do jack for you. Thank you, Sergio Mendoza. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, Damon Bates. Appreciate it. Matt Field says he loves a stereo rig at home. At home. Yeah, it's fun to play with. But, you know, go see almost any great band. Most of the guitars are mono. John Williams says the primary side polarity switch can have an effect on stray leakage and hum since it is AC in, in, in the real world not fully balanced. Best not to give the undertrain too many options. Um, you're, on the last point, you're absolutely correct. Um, I'm not convinced that it would um, really be a big effect on leakage and hum uh, in guitar amps. Now, if you're designing uh, stuff that works you know, very high frequency gear, very sensitive stuff in telecommunications. Yeah, he, that stuff becomes a big issue. I think that's more your world. Um, uh, leakage and hum, yeah, you never want uh, something that fails. And if you, if you do have a capacitor connected to your AC mains to ground or whatever, uh, you want to use an X-class capacitor rated for much more than the AC present, whereas most film caps used in guitar amps on AC are not really rated for very much AC. They have high DC ratings, which is very different. I'm not telling John anything he doesn't know. I'm just sharing with the rest of the class. Amen to what Brad's saying about the 84s and screen, screens um, and, and check the uh, grid resistors. The 470 ohms don't fail in those very often, but they can if you have a tube failure. Yeah, two AC30s makes a great stereo rig, but so does one AC30 with a really good sounding mono rig. You know, Edge uh, from U2, whether you like U2 or not, or like certain periods or not, 
certain bands, uh, Beatles, Stones, Police, Metallica, U2, you, you have to respect their accomplishments. The guy's got more money than any of us will ever have if you put us all together. And, um, you know, he could do anything, and he's running mono effects into tube amps. And he, now, now that he's forging and having like four amps on at once, but it's still mono. Um, you know, you see all these streets patches of delays with ping pong delays. Listen to the record. It's not ping pong delays. It's a, it's a mono dotted eighth in one guitar part. And there's an overdub, which, which has a different pattern. And it's, but to replicate that live, he doesn't have multiple delays. He, his plays his main part with a dotted eighth and it with modulation. It sounds just like himself. It's amazing. Sorry, I digress. I need to get back to the questions. Thank you, Mario V. Appreciate you. Um, McFats, yeah, uh, we've talked about books and, and online classes. For books, start off um, with uh, uh, valvewizard.co.uk. He's got some chapters and articles there and the links to his books. That's where I would suggest most people start. And for online classes, no. There are no online classes. So if you watch enough of Brad's videos and my videos and Jason Tong's videos, you, and I need to check out what you're doing uh, there, Alex, at Serious Amplification. You can cobble together a pretty good idea, at least of what not to do. But um, uh, if you want to take actual in-person classes, which is where you get the real benefit, look at Bruce Egnator's Amp Building Classes out of Detroit. He offers a couple of those a year. Hit that lick button, guys. I need to remember to do my version of that same thing from time to time. I, I, I set all this stuff up to be all professional and, and uh, you know, grow the channel and all that crap, and I forget to do it. Uh, hey, uh, Clyde, um, I was on the basement thing uh, in the sections where I had the master volume all the way up. It was very loud. Um, it was probably 90 plus dB and where I'm sitting is louder as you're closer to the cab. I had the cab eight feet that way from me, uh, eight to 10 feet, depending on where I was sitting when I was playing. But yeah, it's, you know, it's a 45, 50 watt amp on 10 until I turn on the master volume, which is why it's nice to have the master volume. Thank you, Robert Hastings. Take care. Daniel C., thank you so much. Uh, I have not had any uh, emergency repair stories in a while. Believe me, I will share them because they make for compelling drama on the YouTubes. You know, you know people are old if they say the YouTubes, the Internets, the Kroger, the Walmart. They're either old or they're country. Uh, but uh, no, I, I hope to have some new, new compelling dramatic reveals for you guys in the future. But they're unplanned, as, as most emergencies should be. Neighborhood Dentist, anyone looking for a 1965 blackface Fender Princeton Reverb all original needs tech love? Well, this tech would love to take you up on that, but uh, this tech has too many other bills right now. But maybe someone else will jump on that. Ah, uh, well, you should watch both our streams with a notebook just so you can learn new cuss words, especially with Brad. Uh, I, I'm much more vulgar in real life than I am online, as Brad has, has chortled about many times. Um, but yeah, um, Brad drops as much or more knowledge than I do. He just does it more colorfully. Uh, but you know, uh, it's always uh, beer, beer time somewhere. So you can watch my videos early in the morning with a beer, uh, you know, or you, et cetera, et cetera. It's all up to you. You just got uh, uh, just the co the combos. So you got a, oh, you got a, a half stack of of Valve King speakers or, or the cab. I'm not sure what you're saying, Sergio. Um, I don't even remember what speakers the Valve King had. Was that the Sheffields like they had in fifty one fifties? It's been a long time. 
Yeah, four grand is fair for a really good condition 64 Princeton refurb because it would cost me almost three grand to build one and, and that would be an electronically equivalent, musically, sonically equivalent, but it's not the actual 64 thing if if your 64 has all the original iron and stuff. But uh, I don't think I will be buying any 64 Princeton reverbs for 4, 4, 4K because I could build my own for about 1500 because I don't have to make a profit on stuff I build for myself. That said, I never end up finishing anything for myself, so I almost stopped for the good. Jim Cox, look at the resistors I used in the 67 Baseman videos I've put up. Um, I don't use cement resistors in basements, uh, and I don't use carbon comp in the power supply either. My power supply is all uh, metal oxide and metal film stuff, uh, and uh, um, um, I use um, wire wounds uh, of a different type. Uh, on the output tube, but not the big cement block resistors, wire rounds. But I'm only using a little three watts in the most fender screen resistors. Yeah. <laughs> Lion Circle, uh, I could. I don't know whether I'm going to be able to anytime soon. I'm playing catch up and I've got three boxes right now I've got to get done by like Tuesday where the owners will come at me with pitchforks and torches but uh, I'm I'm working towards the goal of being caught up and neighborhood Dennis yeah I understand you want if someone takes a beautiful lamp like that you want to know that they appreciate it hey Ricky Compton David James, bias fairy trims aren't inherently hard on big bottle tubes, but there's just uh, some tricky considerations, and you got to make sure you don't have any any thud getting through. Uh, let's see. I think people are talking about um, the um, semi-channel announcement I made two intermissions ago, so I'm never going to get caught up on this chat today. I'm sorry. Hey, Rod. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're you're wasting as much time, almost as much time on my channel as I am making this stuff. I'm not, I don't think either of us are wasting our time, but I appreciate you spending time on my channel. I'm sorry that I was not able to give you uh, fun news, but, you know, sometimes... The best thing I can tell someone is don't spend any money on that thing. Go get something worth your time and effort and money. Let's see. Trying to get caught up. Ricky Compton Basement 135 is a very peculiar sounding app. It's not like the 60s basements at all. The Basement 135 is essentially just one of the biggest, loudest silver faces in the world. For the money, I, th I think there are better models than the Basement 135. But play one, if you can, and decide for yourself. Because in the end, it is whichever way you go, it's not a... It wouldn't be a mistake. It just might not be the best use of your funds. Thorsten Mater, I answered about two rocks twice already earlier in um, um, in in this in this chat. So go back. I'm sorry. I'm trying to move on some stuff. Steve Milk, he wants an app for that SRV Lenny Tone. Uh, that isn't like a thousand dollars. I don't think that that exists. Yeah, um, you can go. You can find late '70s super reverbs and twin reverbs for under a thousand dollars, and put about four hundred dollars into getting them made perfect. And uh, if Stevie Ray were to come to your house and plug into it, he'd sound just like that. So, I mean, those amps will do it. A '76 twin, a '76 super reverb, recapped with all the CBS spaghetti shortened and a few little tweaks done, like I've shown repeatedly, and a lot of the wax taken off the board. You'll, 
have an app that Stevie Ray would have sounded just like that through. Um, you can do that. You can get a deluxe reverb reissue, do the $200 worth of mods I've discussed already, and uh, replace the 6.8K resistor in the, in the, uh, for the mids with a 1.5K and Lenny all day long if you sound like that. I, you know, Lenny's one of the things I bust out out of habit on the Strat all the time. I'll do that or Yellow Lead Butter, and a lot of amps and, and, uh, will do that. Um, the variable is, is, uh, is uh, to sound like Stevie Ray, you need to have been Stevie Ray. All right, so now I'm talking about Jay Massa's stuff. Gooden's discovering why it's frustrating from our end to do these streams sometimes because on some platforms and some apps, the, the comment stream keeps moving every time someone comments. Yeah, so that, that used to drive me crazy. That's why I use this program here instead, which is not something you can use to view the channel on, but it's a streaming thing. Because the, the the chat stays more or less where I tell it to be, and I'm going through. If I if I miss anything, I, it is accidental. I'm trying to at least acknowledge every question. Let's see. Hey PF, yeah, I I use the uh, transformer resistance method uh, all the time, which is you know a DCR measurement. Um, in fact, when you see the video on the Victoria tomorrow, I'm going to show you my actual bias figures and. You can backwards engineer what I'm doing using the same thing. I don't show the uh, DCR method online very often because it is one of the more dangerous ones to do. It's less inv invasive than a transformer shunt, but gives you just as accurate a result. I'd say it's the most accurate thing you can, accurate way of measuring bias without uh, modifying the circuit at all. But it is dangerous, and I don't want to put that on YouTube and have someone emulate what they think they saw me do or not know that, hey, if I move this quarter inch, the amp blows up or I electrocute myself. So I try to keep the real dangerous stuff off. You know, I was looking back at that video where I'm disconnecting the, the uh, 10 nanofarad shunt cap on that plate resistor on the basement or thing. Maybe I shouldn't have put that on YouTube because I'm literally holding the cap and making it go to, and connecting and disconnecting it with my fingers. Someone might not understand that the body of that capacitor has no voltage on it, but the, if I were to touch the lead, I would. Also, didn't show that before I desoldered that, I I uh, powered the amp off and discharged it um, because it looks in the video like I just suddenly start desoldering and the amp might still be on, which you don't want to solder to a live B-plus connection. So uh, the presentation on YouTube is not always the same thing as the real work. And I don't mean that in any deceptive way, just some stuff is not safe for prime time. See you, Dustin Thiessen. Let's see, talk about solder stuff. David James says, maybe Lyle needs chassis soldering theme music. Well, it's interesting to me. Um, some of the videos I've done recently have had uh, background music. And some people really like it, and some people really don't. I kind of like it. I'm inclined to do it, though. And that last one I did it, there was one section where I had it up a little too loud. Um, and, and yet, if I, if I turn the background music off, people will also say that I, I'm accuse me of being in love with the sound of my own voice. In my experience, it's your guys' wives who are in, in love with the sound of my voice, not me. Yeah, deluxe reverb issue with the G, WGS 12, G12C, especially if you reduce that 6.8K down to like a 1.5K, 2.5K resistor, or you have a variable mid spot added to it. You can Lenny all day long as long as you sound like Stevie Ray to begin with. 
Brendan Gauntner, I ask, answer your question about the uh, single-ended uh, crate vintage club earlier, um, which tells me it was a long time b before I answer your first question. Um, sorry, it's uh, fun to try to, I try to get all of them. Um, all right, so Craig Maloney, hey Craig, uh, West, West Virginia. I have an early 2000s custom five Rolex reverb with Jensen blue speakers. Love it, but it has a slight hiss. Any any videos on this amp? I think the the Vibrolux reverb has the. Uh, um, the I'm pretty sure the custom Vibrolux re, uh, reissue has the same split plate arrangement that they used on the Vibro Verb. Um, that might could be an area of where you would look into it. A lot of them will have a slight hiss. Look at my videos on the Deluxe Reverb where I show that the trace from the reverb channel, vibrato channel reverb, uh, volume pot going back to v2b uh, uh, on the grid that trace itself picks up noise and i cut the trace it's at at the, at the pot or near the pot and i remove the little green wire going to the grid and i replace it with shielded wire so the little tricks with all the reissue fenders but unless i had your amp in front of me i couldn't tell you that also know that some degree of hiss or white noise is normal in any fender reverb app um, it's very rare for them to be totally silent, but there are degrees. RJ Electric disagrees with me about explorers sitting down. Well, if you have an arm on the couch here, you're, you're SOL. Uh, I, I, th I think explorers are great. I don't. I'm not a big fan of V's, but explorers are cool guitars. But they're they're unwieldy. You know, it's a big hunk of of excess wood, um, and it, it can be hard to negotiate the logistics of it. Hey, basement pedal demos. I went and put an FX loop in a, in a Tweed Twin kit. Uh, the, the output section and the phase inverter are going to be pretty dirty in those, so you're not going to get much benefit from it. Look at look at uh, the thing I did with Dave Friedman uh, two weeks ago, uh, the, the technical difficulties. We, we went over that. Um, there are amps that effects loops aren't great in, and that Tweed Twin is certainly one. Um, there are various options on the market today where you can take the, the speaker level and send that out to effects and stuff, but I don't think you need to have an effects loop in a Tweed Twin. I think it's there cross purposes. Run effects in front of a Tweed Twin. Uh, you've got to learn how to work the levels with a higher gain app like that, but it works just fine. Um, I don't think that uh, Bonamassa is using too many effects loops, and whether you're a fan of it, of him or not, and I don't, I don't really have an opinion on that. Um, the sound coming out of off his stage is is pretty much one of the things that people want, want to have. So, Leland Berg. This is funny to me because you put all this uh, pink hand waving, pink hand waving. Mojo Tone is fifty dollars off in all custom cabs this weekend, and the, but it made it hard to see what you're actually saying because you were trying to get so much attention with all the other stuff. But yeah, but to the the uh, the, the person earlier who was um, asking about a good two by twelve, if Mojo Tone's fifty bucks on all custom cabs, check them out. They do good cabs. Ron Carter, Wildwood Amps. Uh, where can you get quality silver mica caps? You can get them from Mauser, you can get them from DigiKey, you can get them from C Distribution. You want the ones that say CDM um, uh, or CDE, Cor uh, Cornell Dublier. You do not want the ones that say SM alone. And you can get the ones that say Sozo if you want. They're, they're fine. You pay an awful lot for them. But I'm not a huge fan of any Silver Micas as far as the sound goes. Um, I like the polystyrenes here once in a while. And I like, uh, you know, they're very fragile and can be prone to microphonics. In general, I like ceramic better. But the CDM, the Cornell Dublier, and the Sozo branded silver micros are good. Just avoid the generics that just say SM. Uh, Dwayne Jessam, I'm not familiar with the GVT15 combo. I, 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 I find most fans to be more marketing than anything else. Depends on the app. Uh, some apps do need it. But, uh, you know, um, if it's noisy, switch it off or disconnect it. It's usually pretty easy to do. 
Um, uh, Ashley Weaver, magnetone amps are generally pretty good. Um, they're kind of approaching, uh, as far as construction method, some of, some of the hand-wired ones are kind of approaching car as far as construction, including some silicone overusage. Others are more PCB. Um, I don't have big faults to give them other than they are not really building true magnetone circuits these days. Uh, some of their magnetone, like the Twilighter I had in, it was a Fender AB763, which had the magnetone tremolo added to it. Other than that, it was the stock Fender circuit. And I've had the old 60s magnetones in, and the circuit was different that the tremolo was in. So I, they're pretty, and I think they're a little bit overpriced, but they're not bad. Hey, Nomi Tulap, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, the, I've not played the reissue 4100. I've certainly played my share of JCM 900 4100s that I've had in for service. Uh, it won't. Well, vintage EL34 Marshall Tone, do you mean vintage 60s, 70s, or do you mean 90s? Because uh, I'm told that the 90s is now vintage, in which case the um, JCM 900 does an excellent 90s vintage sound. Um but no, the 900 is a very different sounding app than the 800 or any of the uh, 60s and 70s models. Um, and there's, it's not that one's better than the other, but they're not interchangeable. So um, play one, see what you think. Steve Milk, I know in Pennsylvania, around in the Philadelphia area, I know Rob DeStefano. He's just outside of, of, Phil, of Philadelphia. Kind of, I think he's halfway between Philly and, and, and New York. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Victoria Ivy League. Uh, a Blues Deluxe looks like it. Hey, Harry's Downtown Bunker. Yeah, if I were... The general guy doing my occasional pickup installation and doing uh, instrument cables or minor repairs, I'd get a Hakko uh, FX888D. I'm pretty sure that's the model number. I think they're like 110, 120 bucks. Um, you might find one used occasionally for closer to 80. Uh, I used to recommend the 936 series, which is what I still have up there, and I use it quite. I used it for a long time, and they're good. But Brad informs me that those tips are getting harder to get, and that can make a huge difference. So I guess the FX888D would be the one to go for. Is there any difference in having 1x12 combo and a 1x12 in a combo for a Tweed Deluxe? You mean like a head versus head? with a separate cab configuration versus the combo with all in one, um, bear in the woods, they will sound different, uh, because of, uh, acoustic properties of, of the chassis and tubes vibrating more in the combo versus the head. And, uh, a separate cab gives you the opportunity to have more internal volume of the cabinet than in most combos, but they do sound different. And even though on paper, the head versus larger cab, is theoretically better than the combo. Other people will prefer the sounds of the combos. And the way, um, forgive me if I say this, by the way, nature of your question makes me think that you're, you're kind of new to this or easing into this. Um, one of the ways that you'll hear that difference is that a combo, especially a small one by 12, tends to sound a little more focused on the mids, a little more congested, a little less full. And, um, a larger dimension cabinet, even with a one by 12, will tend to have more low end, a little more high in extension. We'll still have mids, but they won't be quite as prominent. And the best way for you to learn this is for you to play the same app in a head form versus combo form. They're different. Uh, either can be great, a great choice. People just think hand wired means it's great. Whose hands? Whose hands? Brad's hands? Yes, great. Uh, a lot of the people uh, wiring stuff and they're just looking at the clock trying to get this piece work done so they can get paid for the number of amps they do an hour. Not so much. Yeah, and Wes is simpling me. 
Yeah, Steve Milk. Yeah, well, the Victoria is the Victoria is an expensive app, but you get what you pay for. And the owner of this app is getting more than it than that because he's having me undo some of Victoria's mistakes. You know, sometimes I play it in a high 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 price point, and sometimes I'm like, hey, um, this five hundred dollar used AC fifteen can be made fantastic for a little bit of work. And sometimes I'm able to say, dude, just go get a three hundred fifty dollar. Um, uh, 50 watt version of the Boss Katana, and that'll suit your needs. I'm not a snob, but I also play at you know. I've not seen anything in any any app ever that I could not do, uh, except uh, lack of interest or um, uh, the the tooling to set up to do a particular thing would be too much to do. But none of this is magic. Um, I like simple things done well, and sometimes a complicated thing, if it's done well, is just a, a series of simple things that add up to a complicated thing. But uh, sometimes that costs money. That's just how it works. Getting some questions asked more than once that I already answered. Yeah, okay, Bear in the Woods, I understood your question, good. If the FX600s for 40 bucks a piece are still out there, uh, trust you can trust Matt, Matt Fields on that. I just didn't see the FX600 when I was looking to answer that question for someone else a couple weeks. Whoa, Brad, it's your anniversary. Why the hell are you here instead of hanging out with Michelle? Unless she's sick of your shit already. It's been a whole year of it, Jesus. Love you, Michelle. Hey, Nick Chilton. I don't. I don't think we're gonna have time today for me to talk about all the various post PI phase inverters. Uh, but I did put up a video on the Larmar uh, yesterday or the day before. And um, that's usually going to be the best option of any post-phase inverter master volumes. And I know that's a blank, blanket statement, but yeah, you know, and because you know that's just like your opinion, man. But uh, it really, really is good. Um, uh, I don't know the Pillow Talk radio personality, Detroit, but it sounds like uh, he owes me royalties because I'm probably older. Um, where's the button i need to make that go away here it is um we are at the third hour and i think we all have things to do i, I mean i'd stay here all day because i'm a glutton for attention but uh you know it, it's a lot so let me zing up uh scroll down and try to get caught up as much as possible make sure i didn't miss any super chats uh super chats that uh that had uh, dirk brahm I, I i'm doing a drive-by answer for you the um uh, Current production, even the custom shop, uh, Fender tweeds are not worth it. Um, don't waste your money on them. You can go to uh, you can go to Victoria and get better at the same price. You can go to uh, if you want the brown stuff. You uh, look at the Sir um, um, Ombre. There's a world of company. I think. I think. Um, uh, there's another brand that does really good tweed styles. I can't remember the name of it right now. But Allen Apps. Look at Allen Apps and look at Victoria if you want uh, an authentic one-to-one -one copy of, of, a, of a Fender tweed. It's going to be much, much better and uh, same or lower price than the custom shop uh, Fender stuff. Man, the turnout today has been fantastic. Um, um, you know, I wish we could do this uh, all talking to each other at the same time. It'd be noisy as hell, but fun. Um, but uh, I don't think we're going to be able to get to any more questions today. I'm just going to make sure I don't miss any Super Chats. And it's not that Super Chats are more important to me, but if someone gives me money to answer a question, I'll damn sure try to honor that. I think so far I've only missed one Super... Well, there was one stream that crashed and some got lost, and I, I feel bad about that. But other than that, I've only ever missed one, and that was last time... And I saw it afterwards, and I um, uh, 
found it and answered it in the comments. So if you were that person who gave me a super chat that was not answered, it is in the comments on that one. Hey, Jeremy Horn. Are you Memphis Jeremy Horn? You can just call me, man. Uh, some guys, some speakers, real fast on that question, it's interesting. Um, some some speakers that'll be labeled 30 watts or 20 watts are actually, that's a very conservative rating that can handle that. And some amp builders are like, well, I like the way that speaker sounds when it's on the verge of dying, so I chose it. And if it dies, you just get another one. And that's, that's a decision that um, designers don't make lightly or should not. And buyers and amp owners should not make lightly. So it needs to be something to consider. Um, um, you know, uh, sometimes the price of tones is 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 too much. Bring you know, on Brian May when he goes on tour with all his AC thirties. He also has a truck full of replacement speakers, and they change them out on the road. But he's got money that we will never even be able to imagine, and I can imagine a lot. Let's see. Thanks to Goose Chase Music. Appreciate that. Martin Reed, I don't have... I have a preference for Fender mostly because I'm more familiar with Fender. I've played Fender longer, and I'm still trying to learn um, all all the places my hands need to be to get the most from Gibsons because uh, they're very different. They're very different. Um, it's, it's, it's not to the extreme, but it, it's a matter of degree, you know difference between a, a steel string and a classical guitar, they're almost like different instruments. It's not that extreme, but it's still the same thing. A Gibson, uh, where your right hand sits, the angle of everything, the attack of everything. I'm just more familiar with Fender, but I love my SG, and I love the 335, and I'm trying to learn them. But I've got, the, my Fenders and I have decades more experience. Hey, Chris Butler, you met with uh, Keith and Jeff and, and, and Beato. That's cool, man. Yeah, uh, I was talking to Keith yesterday. I mentioned this before, and uh, he's, he's, a, he's a great guy. And uh, I, look, I hope to meet Jeff and, and that other guy at some point. You know, it's one of those things, you know, I've, I've, I, if I were to, hey, Simon Hosford, good to see you. Hey, thank you very much, man. Um, I'm, I'm heading I'm wrapping this up, but thank you, Simon. Um, you know, I, I genuinely would like to talk to and maybe even get to know Rick Beato because he's interesting. But the thing is, he's like the biggest guy in music YouTube world, guitar music world, and I'm small fry. And so I would always be, he, he would always be like, what does this guy want from me, et cetera, et cetera. It's a weird imbalance. Hey, Jack Bird. Thank you very much for that, man. Uh, so you know, uh, you know, Keith's doing much better than I am on on YouTube, but I, it's not quite the three billion, you know, as many subscribers as McDonald's sells bad hamburgers level. Um, that's if if anyone thinks that's jealousy of of uh, Rick Beato, it it totally is. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's not to be jealous of? My God, what an accomplishment in a crazy, crazy made up world we have here. But, um, uh, you know, so if I were to meet Rick and it's not, it would not be a meeting of equals unless he went out of his way to make it. So, but, but, uh, other guys in the YouTube world that I get to meet, it's a little less of that imbalance. I don't know. It's, but I, I want you to know that I'm ready, uh, and I'll play it cool. When I, when I did that work for Elvis Costello, it was so hard being in the room with the guy. I'm five, 10 feet away from the guy that I, 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 I love his songs like I love the like Lennon and McCartney, like I love Cole Porter. He's one of my favorite songwriters of all time. And I was just dying just to say thank you, whatever. But it was not my job to be there as a fan or an appreciator. I was there to make his stuff work. So thank you, Mr. Costello. I'll get right on it. You know, just trying to be invisible because he was – in the studio, he was rehearsing, he was writing, he was trying to be in a creative headspace. It was, it was not a presser, it was not a, a meet and greet, and I didn't make it that way. So it's, it's, it's a weird aspect of this business when you do get to meet uh, your musical heroes, uh, or people like Rick Beato who are operating at a very high level within what you do. You gotta learn to play it cool 
or you need to do something else. Uh, yeah, Clark uh, is another uh, good option for Tweed stuff. I think we're going to start wrapping it up. Um, and you could get Matt Fields to make you one too because he knows how to do this as well. Uh, eventually, I'll be able to do that for people as well. I'm just so swamped. I, you know, you know, I'll get there someday. Uh, all right. Uh, I think that I think I think we're caught up, and I know that I didn't get to everything, and so be it. We'll come back next time. Actually, next one will be um, first, hopefully the first Saturday of of uh, November with Chris Nix and the next episode of Technical Difficulties. So that'll do about an hour interview, an hour uh, of you guys asking questions of Chris, and then I'll probably do an hour, hour of this afterwards. But um, <coughs> after that, I'll do another solo one like this. So any questions you didn't get, I didn't get to today, please come back. Uh, I want to answer them all. I just cannot because there's only so much time. Thank you all for joining me, and and you make you make this what what it is. Whatever it is, it's either to your credit or it's all your fault.